Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporta. This is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, November 20th, 2016. This is episode 1342. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Texture, the mobile app that lets you access the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere using your smartphone or tablet. For your 14-day free trial, visit texture.com slash twit. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about uh, tech, hmm? Computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, the Twitter, the Facebook, the Instagram, the Snappy Chatty, and all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is my number. I know I said that fast. Let me say it slower. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada if you're listening outside that area. Just understand that the word solder, as I pronounce it, is solder in your neck of the woods. That's what I mean. I mean solder. <laughs> I got an e I got an email from somebody saying, I don't I don't understand. You keep saying solder. <laughs> well, you know that that's the technique you use in electronics when you have a heated little pen and some uh uh flux that you can heat, a little bit of metal that you can heat and melt, and it, it binds electronic uh, components to the to circuit boards and they call that soldering but it's spelled s-o-l-d-e-r and uh, i guess it's confusing if you're outside the u.s I, in canada do you say solder or solder i don't remember it's just one of those things uh, it's just <laughs> just so you know and if you're outside this area you can also reach us via skype and still call us and everything we get calls from all over the world which is kind of fun it's interesting, you know, um, radio, talk radio is really the most local of media, isn't it? I mean, you when we talk on talk radio, we're talking to the, uh, you know, the community. It's very, you know, local. And I always liked it, live local, right? That was always the, the thing, live local. There'll always be a demand for somebody talking live about the issues you care about locally. And, I, you know, I think that's probably true. But the uh, internet changed things a little bit. And now uh, what I do uh, is instead of a geographic community, it's local to a community of like-minded individuals, geeks, people who are interested in technology. And so I local in that sense, I guess, to a, to a, a, a interest group. Live, yes, uh, but not geographically local. And what's interesting is, that, you know, when you're talking to an interest group, it could be anywhere in the world. And thanks to the Internet, it often is. And it's, it's a challenge, I think, sometimes for radio to think that way. There are radio stations, many of them, maybe the station you listen to that uh, right now, that you're listening to right now, that won't, that streams on the Internet, but will not let people outside of its area listen, usually outside of the United States. The thinking being, well, it costs us money. This is one thing that's different about uh, Internet media as opposed to broadcasting. See, people who own radio stations have a kind of a different economic model. Welcome to the 21st century, right? The Internet has changed economic models in every business. Well, the economic model for uh, radio, local radio, is you sell advertisements for local businesses on, and, and those businesses support the radio station. But And... and you know, it doesn't cost you uh, more to have more people listen. In fact, that's all good, right? Once you build a tower and you get a transmitter and a, you know, a license to broadcast, uh, that's a fixed cost. Radio stations don't spend more on electricity the more people who listen. They don't, it's not. It's just this is the bill monthly. It doesn't change. The tower goes and you hope people will pick up your transmission. 
Then you get to the internet, and the model is, is completely turned on its head. Every single person who's listening costs you more money. The cost up front is low. You don't have to build a tower. You don't have to have a transmitter. In fact, you could do it with a laptop and an internet connection. You put a video on YouTube. It doesn't cost you anything. If a million people watch it, whatever. But if for a radio station, they're paying for the bandwidth. So everybody who listens is, in effect, downloading a file continuously from that server and costing them money. So some radio stations say, well, oh, you know, we don't want people listening overseas because they cost us money, but they don't make us money because the local advertisers aren't getting any benefit from people listening overseas. And so they'll actually attempt to cut that off. I think the same uh, thinking goes into the BBC's iPlayer. You know, you if you live in uh, the UK, you can watch television shows that the BBC makes on uh, the internet using an iPlayer, the program called the iPlayer. But uh, the BBC blocks that internationally. The reasoning being, well, uh, BBC is supported by television set license fees. In the UK, they pay, people pay for their TV set. They pay license fees to watch the BBC. That's what funds the BBC. And if you're not paying license fees, well, why should you be able to consume our content? It's just costing us money. Again, costing us bandwidth. And so they try to block that. I understand that might change in the future. But this is an example of how uh, the way you've been doing business has just changed dramatically by the Internet. And it applies to us, too. You know, I've been thinking about this lately. I, w I was reading an article about income inequality. And, of course, that's a big problem, uh, not just in this country, all over the world, that there are some people who are making vast sums of money. Look at the uh, Internet billionaires, right? They seem to be springing up like daisies, or like wildflowers, like weeds all over the place. Uh, and then there are people whose jobs are disappearing, uh, who can't, businesses that can't flourish in an internet economy, like, you know, maybe radio stations trying to figure it out. Look at Kodak. Kodak even knew the internet was coming, but they couldn't make a business that, would as, that was as lucrative as the film processing, developing, and printing business. That... <laughs> So they went, they went bankrupt, even though they, they, had a, they were one of the first digital camera makers. They had online sites. They did everything right. They tried to, trans, but they couldn't transform the business to digital. So there's a, this, this kind of disruption we're going through. It is a massive disruption. It's changing everything. And that's kind of what we talk about in the show is how the world is changing and how it changes your life. But I, I, what I don't talk a lot about is how it changes jobs. And this article was very interesting, talking about income inequality, pointed out that there are some jobs that just can't benefit from the Internet. You know, and there are some jobs that can. And if you can create a business or a job for yourself that leverages these new technologies, you can have a company of five people, like Instagram, that's worth a billion dollars. Instagram was just really just a small little app created by Kevin Systrom and a small team, a few people, a handful of people. They sold it uh, to uh, Facebook for a billion dollars. And in fact, <laughs> that, was, they got it, that was cheap, <laughs> it turns out, because Facebook uh, bought WhatsApp, similar small little app, for what has turned out to be well over $20 billion. And it's, I think it's, dis, it's discombobulating to those of us who kind of grew up in an era where you worked hard, you worked for a company for your whole life, you, you slowly rose to the ranks, your income went up, you know, not billions, but it went up, and then you retired at the age of 65, got a gold watch, and lived on your pension. And that whole world is, is falling apart, is, is being tossed around by the disruption caused by technology. So if you're a young person, I was talking to somebody yesterday, uh, who said, I want, I, I, uh, is IT a good business to be in? I get that question a lot. And I said, yeah, the right kind of IT. I said, what do you like to do? He said, I like to fix computers. So that's the problem, I said, because that's a business that doesn't scale, right? If you're fixing computers, as fun as that is and as wonderful as it is, and we need people to fix computers, A, computers are getting less and less fixable. That new MacBook Pro cannot be repaired, can't even be recycled. It's just a, a, it's like an iPad or an iPhone. It's a fixed unit. So you're, the future of somebody who can fix a computer is, at best, <laughs> murky. But if you can take your skills and expand it to include what's happening, disruption, maybe become an expert on internet or networking or network security, then those same skills can apply to a much broader world. 
and have much more success. I've been thinking about that. What do you think? I just I've been thinking about that lately. How we can recast what we do for a living to take advantage of this disruption instead of losing our jobs, our income, our self-respect. 8888 ask Leo is a phone number if you want to talk about that or or if you want me to help fix your computer, I can do that too. 8888 ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, your calls coming up. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And uh, way off in her special chamber, her soundproof room, my closet, somewhere way <laughs> far away from me, is Kim Schaffer, our phone answering machine. Yes, all full. All full. All How full. do you do that? You've got your people. They like to call. What are you doing for Thanksgiving this weekend? This week? It's very sad, actually. My parents have abandoned me for the second time in three years. So. Come on over. We've got a seven-pound ham. <laughs> ham is one of those things. It, it doesn't matter how many people you have. It just it it's like the gift that keeps on giving. Well, I, it wouldn't disappear with me anyway because I don't eat ham. <laughs> oh well, don't come over then. You won't like no, anything. No, luckily I have friends. Oh, so they've, they've decided to take. Where me are your where you, where's your where's your parents going? They've been in Buffalo since July. <laughs> and they're not. What back are they yet. in the witness protection program? Don't ask. <laughs> Buffalo. I like Buffalo, but winter in Buffalo can be hard. Don't well, you remember those why... pictures from a couple of years ago? Oh, yeah. The... Yeah, my dad was there. <laughs> wow. All right. Yeah, so it's a thing. So anyway, yeah, I, I, all alone on There are nothing like Thanksgiving in Buffalo. No, they won't be there. They're supposedly leaving on Tuesday. Now I'm really driving confused. A, they're driving I think they're avoiding you. I think they are, too. They've done this every year for the past We're three We're going to not be in Buffalo for Thanksgiving. Figure out where we are. <laughs> they will probably be in Wyoming by okay. Thursday. Okay, okay, yeah. good place. <laughs> I would say get them to go to Montana. You can have a little fly fishing adventure. Okay. Thanksgiving in Montana. I keep telling them, hey, when you drive back, take months and months and months and discover the country. Instead, they do it in four to six days. Don't ask. Yeah, me. why would you hurry? <laughs> why? Okay, There's enough no about reason. your parents no and things. <laughs> Let's answer some phone calls. Who do? Who should I talk to Tis here? It's the season to spend people's money. Yes. So Brandon and Rancho Santa Margarita, you're going to spend some Love of spending people's money. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Brandon. How are you today? I'm doing well, Leo. How are you doing? I'm very well. Happy Thanksgiving week, I guess. Yes, happy yes. Thanksgiving. All right, my question for you is, I have a Galaxy S6 Edge. Um, and I'm looking for you know a Samsung watch or you know Android wearable something like that that'll that'll work well with it, as well as you know for future phones that I'm going to upgrade to eventually. So uh, you want a smart watch is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. And there is uh, there are several categories that work well with Android. You even can technically use an Apple watch with Android, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Okay. It's really designed for Apple. I would say either Android Wear, which is a specification, uh, just kind of like Android in general, that Google puts out, but then lots of companies make Android Wear watches. Uh, that'll give you the most choice, is certainly in look, although the functionality is exactly the same in all Android Wear watches. The other choice, because you are using a Samsung phone, is Samsung's own watch. Uh, and the, ga the gear, Samsung gear, there's a gear 2 and there's a, ne a new gear 3, which is a little bit bigger, a little bit better battery life, and has a few more features. And I think both of those are quite good, certainly as good as Android Wear. The only negative is you have to have a Samsung phone. So if you think your next Android phone will not be a Samsung phone, that might not be the best choice. What do you want to do with a smartwatch? What's your what do you what do you see it uh, doing for you? I don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A smartwatch. So smartwatch is an interesting category. Um, <sighs> It's kind of, I think it's, I'm tempted to say it's a failed category. It's not quite failed. Apple has sold millions of them. But even Apple kind of is recognizing now that it's not the, it's not the world beater that they thought it was going to be. It ain't no iPad. It certainly ain't no iPhone. And really what a, a smart watch is an adjunct to your phone. It's a sidecar kind of. So it requires a smartphone in almost every case. There are some smart some actually Samsung makes a, a, a smart watch that doesn't require a phone but it's the size of a phone wrapped around here. It's huge. So uh, that's one negative is smart watches tend to be big partly because they have to get the you know chips and the memory in there but mostly because they have to have some decent battery 
in there. There's also pebbles you might consider if you want longer battery life. And if fitness is your goal with a smartwatch, then there are a large number of fitness devices. Fitbit's the most uh, successful uh, manufacturer in that category that work with phones as well. So there's two categories of things a smartwatch does. One is activity monitoring. Things like uh, steps, you know, it's a pedometer. But a, a good smartwatch, and most of them are pretty good, will also monitor heart rate fairly accurately. And that's very useful. A lot of exercise experts say monitoring heart rate is one of the most important things you can do because when you're exercising, you're trying to hit a target heart rate that is neither too high nor too low. And so it's good, at least initially, when you start an exercise program to be able to see what your heart rate is. It's really also encouraging to watch your progress, to say, ah, you know, I, I met my goals today. Oh, I didn't meet my goals yesterday, but I'm going to do it today. It's really motivating, and I find that to be a big part of, of all smartwatches is this fitness aspect. The other aspect is notifications. So it's, that's where it really acts as a sidecar to your phone. When your phone rings, uh, Android Wear and Apple phone and Samsung phones will all ring on your wrist, buzz you, sometimes vibrate, and you can look and see who's calling. Um, on the Apple Watch and the Samsung, you can actually answer the phone. They have microphone and speaker on the watch, so you can talk into your wrist like Dick Tracy. That's not good for long calls, but it might be enough to say, I'm in a meeting. Can I call you back? I've used it that way. Um, Android Wear watches do not have that capability. But they also can show you messages you've received, text messages or messages from applications what, like WhatsApp. And in some cases, not all, you can reply right from your watch. That's pretty cool. Uh, it will also do things like you can look at the weather. My watch face has the weather on it, and uh, it tells me calendar, upcoming calendar uh, invitations. I get messages, you know, because I use my uh, my messenger to do things like tell me about how my you know my bank bank account is going. If there's a a giant check just cleared, things like that. So that's those notifications can be very handy. Do you, is it both you want to do, or or is it just fitness, or is yeah, I'd say more the notifications than the fitness. Okay. I think an Android Wear watch then is probably a very good choice for you. I'm wearing an um, Android Wear watch right now, as it turns out, the um, Motorola 360, which I quite like. There are new, if you can wait a little bit, the rumor, and it's only a rumor, is that the next generation Android Wear is due out early next year, like in a couple of months. That, you know, and I'd hate for you to go buy a watch and then... A month later, oh, look, they're better, they're better, they're faster, they do more, and they're cheaper, because that would be a bummer. If you like sports watches, there's a company called Nixon. It's very famous with surfers and uh, sports fans. Nixon makes a beautiful Android Wear watch. All Android Wear watches do the same thing in the watch. The only differences are the hardware around it, the style, the design, and uh, in some cases, how much battery life, how much, uh, how much memory. Um, I would also look at the Fitbit. I wear a Fitbit Blaze, which is ugly as sin, but does no, does notifications and does fitness quite well. Um, but but I think from what you if you're if notifications are number one, I think the Android Wear watches do a very nice job of that. And then and the nice thing about choosing Android Wear is you have lots of choices. You can start at the Google Store because they sell a few different ones: LG, uh, Motorola, uh, Nixon. So that's store.google.com. But then if you also Google on Amazon or go to Amazon and search for Android where you'll see a lot of them. They work with all Android phones, including your Galaxy S7. Thanks for the call. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. Nixon's the one. Nixon's very expensive. I didn't mention price. Some of these are expensive. No, I like to give people those big uh, 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 cardboard checks when I pay pay bills. The, the six-foot ones, I love to give those to people. Just joking. Just joking. Yeah, the new Uber TOS is very interesting. I should, uh, yeah, that's a kind of an interesting uh, choice, isn't it? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Wow. Somebody in the chat room said I should uh, I should ask my Amazon Echo to uh, to sing for me, and she did. She sang me a whole song. You want to hear this? This is so we're kind of in a pitched battle now. The Amazon Echo, which has been out for two years, just celebrated her birthday a couple of uh, days ago, has suddenly faced some competition from Google, which makes the Google Home does almost exactly the same thing. 
except by being around for two years, Amazon, I think, has a little bit of a head start. And Google's still playing catch-up. Somebody asked me yesterday, which would you buy? At this point, I would definitely buy an Echo. And actually, what I would buy is the Dot at $50. If you can hook it up to some good speakers, that's perfect. The Dot is a lot cheaper than the original Echo, which started at $200, is now down, I think, to $150. Still a third of the cost, and you get all the functionality. So <clears throat> often when I get up in the morning, what I say is, Echo, good morning. Good morning. The American Music Awards are this evening. They've got me so inspired. I've been working on a new project. Just ask me to sing a song, and I'll try not to get stage fright. Hmm. Uh, okay, Echo, sing a song. Sometimes she doesn't hear me because uh, I've covered her up with a towel. Echo, because <laughs> she listens in the conversation. Echo, sing a song. Who, me? Yes. I couldn't. What? I hit it. <laughs> when my Wi-Fi left me And I'm out in the rain Those last few answers we're hard to obtain. <laughs> Echo, stop. I don't want to pay royalties on all this. So, it's kind of I can't find the song Royalty Velvet Snow. <laughs> okay, Echo, stop. Echo, cancel. Echo, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't able to understand the question. Yeah, no, I know. Question. Oh, okay, fine. Um, I think what Amazon's up to here, though, I mean, it's it's cute, right? It's kind of like a fun little game. But what Amazon would like is for you to kind of start considering Echo your little plastic pal who's fun to be with. Like, you know, you wake up in the morning, they want you to start saying, you know, good morning. And uh, what's what's on my calendar? And, you know, uh, what's my to-do list? Things like that. Start to interact with it. And the more you do, the more you bond, frankly, you bond to it. <laughs> so uh, very interesting. Very, very uh, interesting. Um, I, I, I like this strategy. Some people are a little bit nervous because, of course, the Echo has a very good microphone, really seven microphones inside it that can pick up uh, your voice anywhere in the room. That's the whole idea. You should just be able in a normal voice to say, you know, the command and have it do something. something. And so people are nervous that, well, this thing's plugged in. It's always on the Internet. Is it just sending everything I say back to the home office or the uh, NSA or the CIA? Almost certainly not. The way almost all these devices, including your smartphone work, is they are always listening, but they're not sending data back to the server. They're always listening for a particular pattern. In the case of Amazon, you have three choices. You can call it Echo, Alexa, or Amazon, and you tell it. And then it will be looking for that pattern floating through the air. When it sees that pattern, then it sits up and, and captures everything following it so that it can then send that back to the server. Because the, ser the, the Amazon servers do all the work, not the, uh, not the Echo. All the servers have to do all the understanding of what you're saying and, and what to respond. In fact, the amazing thing is how quickly it works. There's a little bit of time, but not much. And, of course, a lot of engineering goes into that. So I don't really worry too much about it capturing everything I'm saying. For You know, you can verify that it is or isn't doing that just by watching your network traffic. If you have the sophistication and the right kinds of tools, a program like Wireshark, for instance, will watch the network traffic coming out of the device to see if it is constantly sending traffic back. It's, it's, it's conversing with Amazon servers regularly, but not in the sufficient quantity uh, for me to think that it's actually sending back information about what I'm talking about. However, <laughs> there's some evidence that it might, for instance, be listening to what television shows you're watching. Hmm. Uh, there's, there would be, that would be valuable, wouldn't it, to the television networks? They pay a lot of money now to a, a company named Nielsen to get ratings, and Nielsen puts these boxes in uh, the people meters that are because they they need to uh, do it automatedly because people aren't accurate in reporting what they're watching on TV. So the people meter actually can 
pay attention to what you're watching and ultimately can see if there's somebody in the room, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Echo could do that a lot better, couldn't it? It could hear voices. It would know what you're listening to. It could match that up. It could get that information for many people, everybody who owns one. And I'm, I'm not... I'm not certain. I couldn't say with certainty that Amazon is not already doing that or something similar. That's that I would say is a possibility. And more and more we're seeing companies really try to capture this data. This data is more more useful and more valuable to them than actual money that you might be paying for these products. I'll give you an example. You're going to hear more about this over the next few days. Uber has changed its terms of service to say that everything they gather about you, including your rides, where you're going, information that they gather about you, is, is owned by Uber. That's no accident that they're changing that. That is absolutely hugely valuable to them. And you might say, well, how? What do they do with that? Well, just like Amazon might be able to sell your TV viewing habits to the networks, Uber would be able to sell your travel patterns to perhaps stores in your area. Um, what they'd really love to do, and they have the capability of doing this, because you notice Uber's added some features. For instance, if you have a Spotify account and you get in an Uber, your music can start playing. Oh, isn't that nice of them to do that? Well, maybe, but it also identifies you. And... You know, of course, they have your Uber account, but now they know a lot more about you. Maybe even they can use that to figure out how to send you, hmm, I don't know, a text message saying, hey, I see you just drove by Nordstrom. You know, we've got a great deal on blue jeans right now. That's really, that's where privacy invasion is going to start. Now, to me, uh, you know, I'm not nearly as worried about commercial entities knowing what TV shows I watch or where I'm driving, as I am about governments trying to find out more about me. And we're going to watch with interest uh, what's happening in the new administration because, well, the planned director of the CIA is both, has both interesting and some scary attributes. <laughs> uh, he says he believes in mass surveillance and increasing mass surveillance – but at the same time, I'm pleased to say that uh, this new director, Michael Pompeo, this proposed new director, is against backdoors in encryption. But he says he's not worried about encryption because it's too hard to do. So <laughs> he says we just need to surveil more. And with tools like, frankly, Uber and Amazon's Echo in your house, there are lots of ways they can surveil us. That worries me a little more than television network knowing what what i'm watching 8888 ask leo we're gonna take a break come back more of your calls coming up right after this our show today we, uh, brought to you by texture also my peace of mind brought to you by texture texture is awesome it's my it's my netflix for magazines now i like magazines i think some of the best writing certainly some of the best journalism is being done in magazines these days but what I don't like about magazines is the guilt I feel when I subscribe to them. I used to subscribe, for instance, to The New Yorker. And uh, every week I'd get another issue. I'd read maybe one article or maybe I wouldn't read it at all. And it would pile up and I'd feel guilty as heck. I'd go, oh, man, I'm just killing the environment here, not to mention the expense. And, of course, if you buy on the newsstand, it's even more expensive. So how, what do you do? And they don't put everything online. So Texture lets you subscribe to as many as 200 of the best magazines in the world for one flat rate. And I'm talking everything. Yeah, The New Yorker, but also National Geographic and Wired, Consumer Reports and Rolling Stone. You like a little gossip? People Magazine, Sports Illustrated. Unbelievable. Now, you got we got a two-week free trial for you. So this is what I would recommend is you just try this. You can get it on Amazon, Google Play, or iOS texture.com slash twit if you'd like to know more let me uh, just show you some of the magazines i mean it just uh, it, if you go alphabetically you could scroll forever and and what i like about this is like well there's magazines that i should read for my business that i'm not you know i'm just not going to subscribe to ad week right or billboard 
But having it there on my iPad whenever I want it means I'm going to see it. I'm going to read it. I'm going to find out about it. Uh, I love cooking. A bunch of cooking magazines, all recipes and bon appetit. So you always have great stuff to cook. Uh, Birds and Blooms, North America's largest magazine dedicated to backyard birders and gardeners. What? <laughs> Bloomberg Business Week, Bloomberg Markets, Bon Appetit, Boys Life, Brides. And you know, you might say, well, who would be reading Brides and Boys Life? Well, I'll tell you what. One subscription is good for five devices, so the whole family can take advantage of your texture subscription. Normally $10 a month, but free for the next two weeks. Why would you subscribe to a couple of magazines when you can get all of them for less? And by the way, yes, offline, you pick your favorite magazines and download them, and you'll have them whenever you travel. I'm such a fan. I am such a fan. I think you will be, too. Try it free for two weeks. Texture dot com slash twit by the way sometimes it's even better than reading the print magazine because there's stuff like video that you can't get in print every page from the current issue plus back issues it's actually better than a subscription texture.com slash twit we thank them for their support of the tech guy podcast garden and gun Garden and Gun covers the best of the South, including the sporting culture, the food, the music, the art, the literature, the people, and their ideas. And I guess their guns. Gluten-free living. I love this. It's so fun to browse through the uh, through te the app and say, "Oh, I have never seen Garden and Gun. Let me let me read that." Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty-eight eighty-eight. Ask Leo the phone number. Drew in St. Lou. Hello, Drew. Yeah, hey, Leo. Good to talk to you. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for calling. What can I do for you? Okay. So I have I have a question. I'm going to start straight with the question, but then I have a little explaining I need to do. Okay. Um, so, so my question is, I would like to know where I can go to download free and legal copies of old Microsoft operating systems like DOS, Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows XP, and so forth. Um. And here's the explanation. So I have a laptop that's like six years old, and it came with Windows 7. And recently, I, I reformatted my hard drive and reinstalled Windows 7, and then immediately upgraded to Windows 10 yeah. uh, using the free upgrade that has since expired. Um, so I have a nice, fresh copy of Windows 10. Um, and you, you know those those CD-ROM binders that you can use to store all your... Yeah, I have one of those, yeah, or I used to, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, I have a few of those old uh, software binders, and I have some old programs that I would like to install, but I really don't want to cruft up my, my nice new installation of Windows 10 with old software that's going to, you know, try to install, like, QuickTime 2.0 for Windows or, you know, like DirectX 5 or something like that, you know. Um, so what I thought I would do uh, was, um, was down, and actually I did this, um, I downloaded uh, a program called VirtualBox. Yeah. And, and um, that, that allow, that's, a, uh, that's a virtual uh, machine manager that allows, it's free too, which is neat, it comes from Oracle, and allows you to run other operating systems underneath Windows. Right, and and I thought I could maybe try you know dual booting instead, like dual booting Windows 10 with an older version of Windows. But I I, I decided to try uh, virtualization. No, a VM is a good um, way to do this, I think. So here's my here's the problem. Um, I looked through my old software binders, and I think I must have thrown away my old Windows 98 installation CD <laughs> and my old Windows XP installation CD. So there's some issues associated with what you want to do. Um, there are places you can find this. In fact, even Microsoft offers older versions of their operating systems to developers. If you get an MSDN subscription, you can do that. That's pricey. Uh, but that's because developers uh, often want to test you know, cross-operating cross, cross uh, operating system compatibility, make sure it still works with older versions. Um, you can also, and this would, you, there are websites like oldversion.com and an old and uh, oldapp.com that offer old versions of programs. Those are not legal, 
Um, in some cases, the programs are old and nobody wants them. But in the case of Windows, that those Microsoft uh, aggressively maintains those copyrights. But you can also buy copies on eBay, and this would be safer because the problem with these old apps sites, you don't know where they got that ISO, and is it real, and maybe it's modified and hacked, and you don't know. But if you yeah. go to eBay uh, or you know other sites that sell used or old copies of operating systems, you could often get a Windows 95 disk. I think somebody's saying Amazon still has Windows 95 disks for sale. Certainly eBay would have 95, 98, XP, uh, because there's lots of people with those disks and they'll sell them. Here's the problem. It may not be a problem for you, but there's no activation on those. You can't. That Microsoft's taken the servers down to author, authenticate those. So even if you got a serial number that was clean and never been used, which is unlikely in this case, you know, somebody's been using this, um, it would not activate, which means in 30 days it would start to complain and then maybe a few weeks after that it would slow down and eventually would stop working because Microsoft doesn't want you to use these old versions. Now, that's not a big deal with a VM because what you do is take a snapshot at day one and then when it starts to get tired, you just delete it and start using the snapshot and you get another, it resets the 30 days. So uh, you can absolutely do this. Um, what's the oldest version you'd want to get? Well, DOS. Yeah, that's an interesting. Where would you get DOS? <laughs> Somebody's got it, right? And DOS doesn't need to be activated. There's the good news. So uh, there, is a, there is a free DOS, which is out there. It's an it's a open source project to emulate DOS. And it actually works fairly well. DOS box or free DOS. Um, both will do DOS. DOS is easy to emulate because it's not a very sophisticated program. Windows would get a little bit harder. But I would try free DOS and see if it will do what you want. Then you're completely legal and you don't even, I mean, you know, you can use it in a VM anytime you want. But if you need it, I bet you somebody's got it. I mean, sure. And, I, you know, on eBay and other places, I bet you people are selling. I'd have to look. Old versions of DOS. Somebody's saying if you go to ftp.microsoft.com, you can. I don't know if that's true. That would make me. Uh, that would make me happy, because then you'd be getting a legitimate copy. Um, so, it, it DOS is a little challenging because DOS goes back away. I think free DOS would be the best way to do it. Windows ninety five and ninety eight. I don't even know if they had activations. I don't think. Microsoft was using the Windows Genuine Advantage activation servers yet. They That started with XP. So you just need a serial number. But you need a serial number that works. I think there are ways around that, too. The biggest issue is using these old operating systems is a little bit risky. DOS, not so much. But Windows XP, for instance, there are still expo exploits floating around in the wild because there's a lot of XP machines out there, unpatched and vulnerable. So the answer is yes, you can get them from Microsoft legitimately. That would be the best way to do it. Or you can, uh, well, we'll put a link in the show notes uh, to some legitimate ways to get it. Or you can go to the sites, or you could try to buy somebody's old disks. There are old disks out there. Chatroom has all sorts of sneaky tricks, by the way, for getting around activation. So if, if you head over there, maybe, maybe they could help you in ways that I prefer not to if you know what i mean thanks for the call it's an interesting question you know um there's a whole you know culture preserving old video games they say this is our art this is our you know you old movies for a long time people thought ah that's an old movie nobody's gonna want that and now we realize oh we should have saved those we should preserve those many movies have been lost but now there's an active effort to preserve those and there are people who say, you know, the video games of the 80s, even the 70s, those are, uh, those are our culture just as much as an old movie is. We should preserve those. And even though the copyright issue is kind of tangled, uh, I think there's a, you know, if you go to the Internet Archives where they're trying to save everything, including the old Internet pages, they have old video games, hundreds of them, that they've preserved because that's our culture. That's our history. 8888-ASK-LEO. Allbootdisks.com. All bootdisks.com have DOS. 
Not sure it fits that first criterion you uh, you asked, uh, uh, Drew. Is is it legal? I don't know about that, but you certainly can get it. And we will uh, get to Fort Worth and Brett when we come back after news at the top of the hour. 8888 Ask Leo. The website, techguylabs.com. I'm Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You know who owns AKG now? Samsung. Yeah. So they bought all of Harman, which includes Harman Kardon, AKG, a um, lot of other brands. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So, yeah. I, well, I knew that, you know, I, we had said that for $8 billion, uh, we said that on Wednesday, $8 billion, Samsung bought Harman. But what I didn't realize is Harman had been buying up all these other brands all this time. And it's good for us, maybe, because we're on um, their uh, platform on cars. So, the what is it? AHA? The AHA platform? Harman International Industries. They own JBL. No, they don't own Denon, I don't think. They own Infinity. They own B and W Bowers and Wilkins, which is of course the very high end British speaker company. Mark Levinson. Oh, and Revels. They also own Revel speakers, which are the other very high, another very high end. Isn't that amazing? Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, you know. All that tech stuff. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 888-827-5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. and Canada. Outside that area, you can call via Skype. won't cost you anything. And uh, the website is techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com. You know, um, there's some more fallout. I think, I think this is fallout from the Samsung Note 7 debacle. Remember, they made this phone. And I think we now understand what the problem was with the phone. They're making these phones uh, now with sealed batteries, and they want more battery in there, so they jam in more battery. And we think that the problem with the Note 7 is they put in too much battery for the space, and it was causing plating to occur, the lithium uh, I, I would would leak a little bit plate and short circuit the battery over time because it was under pressure. It was squeezed. That's the best thesis I've seen. Anyway, uh, they've taken them all back. There is a rumor they might start to refurbish these, take the battery out, put a new smaller battery in, and sell them again. That's going to be a hard sell, isn't it? But the other uh, the other upshot of this fact that these Note Sevens tended to burst into flame. Not all of them. Not even that many of them. They sold what two and a half million and only a few hundred. More than you'd like, but not all of them. Uh, in any event, the Samsung's gone on a shopping spree. Now, remember, Samsung's a giant, giant company. They do a lot of stuff. They make dishwashers and memory chips. In fact, a lot of the Apple stuff is uh, from Samsung. Uh, they make uh, bulldozers. They make a ton of stuff. In fact, the mobile phone business is only about 5% of their overall business. Nevertheless... Nevertheless, a smart company at this point would start thinking, well, let's think of some other consumer electronics businesses we can get into. So over the uh, past week, about on Wednesday, I think news came out, Samsung was planning to acquire a company called Harman. Good old-fashioned American company. Remember Harman Kardon Stereos? That's where the Harman came from. But Harman is really a much bigger company than that. In fact, Samsung is going to pay $8 billion for this uh, company, but what's interesting is Harman itself had been on a buying spree for some time. So you know Harman Kardon probably, but did you know this also includes JBL speakers, Infinity speakers, Mark Levinson sound, Revel speakers, which are very high high end audio file speakers, Bowers and Wilkins, a, a, a company that was a British speaker company. And uh, my headphone company, AKG, <laughs> uh, all all are owned by Harman. So Samsung is going to be getting a very big business all of a sudden. It's kind of like Apple buying Beats for $3.2 billion. It's a big acquisition. 
luxury sound, studio sound. Almost every radio station I've ever worked in had JBL speakers. I've used AKG headphones for years. I mean, this is a this is a wild, wild. So Samsung are getting into the uh, consumer electronics space in a way besides phones. Speaking of phones, back uh, we go to the phones. And uh, Brett, you've been very patient from Fort Worth, Texas. Thanks for hanging on. Thank you, Leo. Um, what my situation is, is I've got a several IP cameras and a whole bunch of every, uh, other things in my house on my land. And um, I want my IP cameras I want to look at outside my land. Um, and so I've gone into my router and I've opened up the ports that... Um, uh, you know, so so I can see them outside. But when I do think, go to like uh, canyousseeme.org and I check those ports to see, make sure that they're open, it tells me that some of them are 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 blocked or they're they're closed. Um, so I thought, well, could that be my ISP? So I've gone around and around with my it ISP. Could, it could be, by the way, depending on what those ports are. Yeah, and and but. I, I went up several layers in the tech support, and I'm pretty confident that they know, you know, the guys I'm talking to know, and they are telling me that they they don't block anything. And um, Well, I guarantee you so, they block port 25, which is the outbound well, email I port. Even asked, I asked him about that, and he says they do, he said he's aware of that, but at this point in time, as long as you don't abuse anything, um, they're who's, keeping that open. Who's your ISP? A company called Net Nextlink. Okay, so um, smaller ISPs yeah. may, in fact, be a little more generous uh, with their blocking. Here's here's I'll tell you what's going. First of all, this is a you know common problem, right? Uh, and and there's for good reason because what you're doing really is you're opening up your network and servers on your network, and you probably heard a bit about Internet of Things security of late. Sure. So you've got to be very careful if you're going to put anything out in public, which you're doing, that's how you, you know, that's what you're doing, is that, that that stuff is well made and secure. The most important feature of any Internet of Things device is that it is, firmware is upgradable and that the company pays attention and does, in fact, fix flaws and then upgrade the firmware. Ideally, it does it automatically. Not a lot of IoT stuff does that. Most IoT stuff is made by companies in China that couldn't care less. Once they sell it, they're done. And that's why we had that big DDoS attack a few weeks ago based on uh, DVRs and routers and cameras made by a Chinese company called Chiang Mai and then sold under a variety of brand names because Chiang Mai doesn't care. They don't. They don't it's not their problem. <laughs> so in order to get these things serving, because they're servers, right? Just like a mail server or a web server, they're servers. You have to port forward. You have to tell your router when traffic comes in, because you want to be able to establish a connection from outside your network into your network. So normally a router will say, well, I see this inbound request, but nobody inside this network has asked for it, so I'm just going to drop it. I'm going to ignore it. That's the normal behavior of all routers. That's why routers are sometimes thought of as firewalls. So you have to tell the router, well, wait a minute. When something comes in on port 8999, send it to the device at this internal address. That's called port forwarding. Because I'm expecting it. This camera expects it. So what are the ports? You, and by the way, uh, not I don't know. Can you see this may not be giving you the right information either? Can you actually access these devices properly from outside your network or no? One, one of them, um, because port 8080 works, but port 8081 does not. You know, when I did the port forwarding, one of the cam my front door camera I put on 8080, the back camera I put on 8081, and so the one that's on 8081, I can't see it. And when I do canyouseeme.org, it shows that 8081 is blocked. But, you know, well, in my next gear it, router, right. in my next gear router, I have it opened. Right. Um, so I can go down, you know, within my land uh, from my, my PC, I can go to canyouseeme.org, and there's several um, ports that show open, but there's quite a lot that keep showing clo um, that they're blocked that I open up on my router. So Make sure you know, also that you open up the proper 
type of connection. There's two kinds, TCP and UDP. And streaming devices like cameras often want UDP as opposed to TCP. So make sure those are correct. You also may want to use a higher port, a five-digit port. Higher than Oh, really? Yeah, you can go all the way up to 65,335, I think. So, um, what, what's, what's the thought process there? Uh, it may be there's, uh, there are uh, a lot of devices use 8080, for instance, for web browsing. It may be that those lower port numbers are uh, in, in use or reserved. So while that's normally anything above uh, 1024 is usually okay, you might go a little higher just to try it. Have you tried other numbers, other ports? I've tried several of them, um, and, you know, they're, uh, you know. Hang, hang on, i got to take a break. Let me consult with my experts in the chat room. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. And it also is possible your ISP doesn't, isn't, you know, it could be the tech support guys you're talking to don't know that the hardware they're using is actually blocking that port, things like that. Well, that, you know, again, I, I did kick this up because I thought the exact same thing right. uh, with my first round and I kept going up. Can you, you, you know, so you can tell these devices to use a different port. It sounds like you can. I can, I can, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, it's basically in my router. You know, I, I match the IP address of the device with the uh, port that I want open. Well, the device has to also know to look at that port. Usually, each of, de each of those devices will have a port that they use by default. I'll double check on that. Yeah, I mean, you may not... Uh, I mean, that may be another issue. You have to... Um, you you have set up port forwarding on those ports, I would guess. Yes. Yeah, in yeah. in my router, yes. Uh, but you also need to okay. use ports that the device understands. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll look. Yeah, so look in the manuals for those devices. It may say you have to use port one two three four five. And so it won't work if you say eighty eighty one. It's not merely the router. You have to it just it doesn't respond to all traffic coming at it the the camera or whatever. It has to have it come in at a specific port. You know, when I when when I started suspecting my router, um, I you know they don't they don't have any tech support since it's more than ninety days old. But um, other than a forum, so I got on the forum and I explained what my situation was, and they suggested to disconnect the router and plug up a laptop or something directly to the internet and check the ports there. But it didn't seem too logical because. Well, I actually tried it, um, and everything's blocked. And, and yeah, because without the router, only one device can use your internet connection. Your laptop, nothing else is visible. Yeah, that's yeah. bad. Whoever gave you that advice, I don't even understand what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, well, I mean, the the, the idea was to verify that it wasn't the router that was that was causing the problem. Yeah, but the router is the. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, it's the thing that has. Ports, it's the right? thing that's doing the ports. You got uh, so you plug. Okay, so you plugged your laptop into the what the cable modem, and then what? Yeah. And then, but the router was the Wi-Fi. So how are the how is the camera connected to the cable modem? It's not. No, no. I was I was just using my laptop to to go to can you see me dot org to verify whether. A port well, as soon as the router is gone, all those ports should be open. Well, it actually sort of strange. Well, whatever. La actually, you ha your laptop has some All rules. Closed. Yes, your laptop yeah, has yeah, its own yeah. firewall, so it may maybe the yeah. laptop was doing that. Um, yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't diagnose anything because that's not your system. You need to use a router, obviously. So, um, I would you know I mean there there are more sophisticated routing things you could do than just simple port forwarding. There's there's all sorts of you know port translation and triggering and all sorts of things you can do, but this should just work. Um, I'm not uh, not sure what exactly is going on here. The you know there is this larger security issue uh, because what happens if any of these IoT devices are hackable or modifiable? They could give a, an intruder access to your full network through the IoT device, and that's risky as well. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I don't know, and I'm looking at the chat room. They don't seem to have much. But keep listening, okay? And we'll see if we can come up with something for you. Okay. All right? 
Um, All righty. Yeah, you know, it could be the router isn't cooperating. I would try some different ports. First of all, find out what IP addresses the cameras can support and see if they can support anything besides those. Usually, or not IP addresses, ports. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's like got a good name for this uh, last call. Leo Laporte. Port. <laughs> this is, it's so funny because uh, in the early days of the internet, you were just happy to get online. But now we are basically network sysadmins. We are, you know, the geek that used to be the king of the network at the office. That's you now. Because we all have many devices connected to the internet. We've got routers. We've got switches. We've got all sorts of sophisticated technology going. We've got Wi-Fi access points. And you're supposed to figure it all out. And the most tricky, complicated thing of all is this port forwarding thing. The idea that I'm going to put something on the network that is essentially going to be a public-facing server. If you put an, a camera in your house... And you connect it to your network, and the idea is that you can then, from work, surf to that camera. That camera, you are now putting a server on the public internet that is serving up images from your home. And there's two potential problems. One, the security of the camera may be so poor that it has, for instance, a default or backdoor password so that anybody can log in. There were many camera systems that had this problem. So that anybody, because you're in public, remember, can just go, yeah, let me look at the... <laughs> And you can just find that camera and go, oh, yeah, I see inside your house. That's not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is, of course, security of your entire network. Because most of these devices are poorly coded, poorly written. They have, they're, they're vulnerable to an attack. That attack comes in through the public Internet. Because remember, you put your device on the public Internet and then modifies your device in such a way that the attacker can, for instance, get access to all your computers as well. You're, you're, you're putting, when you put the, 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 this is, the names are very descriptive. You have a router, which is also a firewall, you know, a barrier to the outside world. When you are port forwarding, you're opening holes. You're, you're literally opening, well, not literally, you're figuratively opening a, a, a access into your network. So you really have to be careful about how you do that and make sure that the device that you're putting at the other end of that is is secure. There's a lot of issues. If you're buying an Internet of Things device and you plan to put it on the public Internet, you want to see that camera from work or see your doorbell, who's at your doorbell from work, there's certain things you want. You want to get it from a manufacturer that really stands behind it, preferably an American company with a well-known name. You want the certitude that there is, they are keeping an eye on this and they are fixing f bugs in it and that they are, there's a way to update the firmware to fix those bugs. Most devices that you buy don't have that. They are not secure. The company that made them doesn't care they're not secure and, and they're never going to get fixed. This is why the Internet of Things is posing as a huge problem. We were talking earlier also about... Uh, Surveillance, government surveillance. And one thing the national uh, def intelligence community is, is very, very happy about is the proliferation of these Internet of Things devices because essentially people are putting microphones and cameras all over their house in ways that these governments can access easily. There, this is a golden time for governments to surveil their people. And it's interesting, uh, this week in uh, the Great Britain, they've just passed what's colloquially called the Snoopers Charter, which gives the British government unfettered power to do exactly that. Mass surveillance on their people. At any time. <laughs> For any reason. Very little safeguards, very little oversight. And I suspect we'll see something like that in the United States, too. They've been trying to get the Snoopers Charter through for years. It finally went through. So it's just, it's a you know, we talked at the beginning of the show about the uh, Echo and the Amazon Echo and how it has microphones on it and how there's two different ways those are used. Somewhat benign way, maybe you're not happy about it, for commercial purposes. To collect information. I'm, I'm not talking to you. She's listening, see? Uh to collect information that they could sell, for instance, about what TV shows you're watching, they could sell. 
That's one use. The other use is less likely, but a little scarier, is that that information could be used against you by your government. And I think it's a, I think it's a good idea for us to pay attention to this, to be aware of it. Uh, because, uh, you know, you, you, these are not very secure devices. There's this third problem, which is an even, you know, maybe even the biggest problem of all, which is it opens you wide up to hacking of all kinds. 8888-ASK-LEO. Uh, anyway, the, the port forwarding problem, we weren't really able to kind of drill down and solve that. But maybe uh, maybe somewhere um, somebody out there understands what uh, Brett's issue uh, is and maybe can help him. And if you can, go to techguylabs.com and leave a comment there or call. We'll put you on. Don is in Fullerton, California. Our next call. Hi, Don. Don, are you there? Do you hear me okay? I hear you now. Hi, Don. Okay, good. Good. Yeah, I got to watch out for that mute button. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do for you? Um, I'm, uh, I got a Raspberry Pi. It's my first uh, Linux box that I've ever set up from scratch. Isn't that awesome? $35. Uh, and don't you feel great? Did you get it working? Uh, I actually spent about 85 bucks for a complete kit. Oh, you get all the stuff, yeah. With the case and the power supply. And all I, all I had to add was a keyboard and a mouse. And a TV. Isn't that, uh, yeah. Isn't that I, great? Yeah. yeah. $85. Anyway, yeah. Uh, what I'm finding out, though, is the default version of Linux, and uh, I guess it's called Debian, uh, it's, it's actually got another name called Res, Raspberryan. Uh, <laughs> so the folks at Raspberry Pi took yeah. Debian, which is a wonderful version of Linux, and customized it. That's one of the things you can do with Linux. It's awesome. Right. And they call it Raspbian. Because yeah. it's the and Raspberry I, Pi version of Debian. It's a little bit stripped yeah. down, so it can run on that little processor. Yeah, yeah. and I'm running into where I, I can't get the Chrome browser to uh, watch my locally local cable company's uh, streaming videos, but I can, I can download YouTube. I mean, I can download and stream YouTube and all the others, but apparently I can't get all the right plugins together because the whole system is locked down. I well, mean, it's the other way around, actually. Yeah. Because it's an open system, companies that want to use copy protection schemes, digital rights management, yeah. or DRM, do not like Linux. And so there are, there are things you can't do because yeah. they don't want you to, because they're afraid you're going to pirate their signal. So yeah. cable companies would be the first suspects on that list. Um, and so you'll notice that some like flash video you you can get flash drivers for linux but it's a little bit of a different process actually the drivers that work work on youtube perfectly well youtube doesn't use flash anymore and partly for this reason it uses html5 and so it works yeah. fine in chrome yeah. but it is very likely that your cable company is not only using flash but some sort of copy protection that yeah. doesn't work on linux what I'm curious is the, is the procedure, though I'm a little, little unfamiliar with uh, using these NOOBS. Uh, yeah, so Noobs is just a, a boot-up system that allows you to yeah. choose the operating system. And you might, you might uh, re, re, you know, get another uh, little mini card, flash card. That's yeah. your storage. Put Noobs on it, and instead of choosing Raspbian, choose Plex or XBMC, choose a media server. It will be better able. It may not be able to do what the cable company does, but it will be better able to do that. Coming up, photography with Chris Marquardt. Stay right here. You're out. Yeah, that's what Noobs is for, is to let you choose... Uh, Don, you're still there because I we had yeah. to take a break, but I had to, but I I could still talk to you. So um, yeah. that's what Noobs lets you do is choose other operating systems, and I I'm, I can't remember which one they have a media player operating system though. They do they do in fact that uh, that was my next question. Yeah, Rasp BMC or something like that. I yeah, yeah. I uh, I do notice there's always that shift button. Yeah, there's that shift option there that gets short. When I boot up, I always can press. It says press shift for recovery. Yeah. And I get the same menu. Oh, good. As if I'm starting, as if I'm starting the noobs from scratch. Right. And so you can, what you can do is have different yeah. little uh, micro flash cards for yeah. different purposes. So you could have one with Raspbian on it, and you could have one with a media system on it. Yeah. All you have to do is pop it out, put the new one in. You can download noobs from the Raspberry Pi site, put it on a micro uh, flash card. Yeah, I even got the reader. I even got the little micro yeah. reader. So that, you're set. Uh, put, uh, yeah. Adapt it to a so if you wanted to, you could get multiple little TF cards and use those 
Yeah. Uh, or you could uh, redo yours. If that's if the main reason you're using it is as a media player, then probably it'd be worth just taking off yeah. Raspbian and putting Kodi on or whatever it is that it comes with. Yeah. Uh, another security-related question. I notice it does come with uh, VNC client and yep. server yep. Uh, servers, and uh, I guess the uh, the only real protection I've got is the strength of my password, or is there... A back door or anything. No, no, no. You're Anybody safe. Else? That server does not go out onto the internet. It is only, it, 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 you'd have to route it to let it out on well, the internet. If, if it's I, only in, said, it's if, only in your internal network that it's. Seen. If I if I port forward to it to get get me access to it, I would obviously port forward to a specific IP address. That's or, right, and then. You know, I, at I that point, that. your password is the only thing protecting yeah. you. Yep, that's yeah. correct. Uh, but, but yeah. Uh, I, I was just going to say, uh, I, I should I should be careful because yes. uh, I did change my my default Raspberry Pi password, but I noticed that yeah. Rasp Raspberry the, the Raspberryan people or the, or the Debian people or the, even the it's Raspberryan it's the Raspberryan people have a default password. Yeah, and anyway, they've changed the root user password. Right. It's not. It's not blank. Like it. Like I understand, a Linux system fresh out of a box should have the root user password blank, right? No, you absolutely never ever want it that way. You never must have a them. no. You don't want to. You should have yeah. a strong root password. They do it on uh, on the Raspberry Pis because they don't really expect those to be put out on the public network. Yeah. But nice even if they time. are, you'd have to have some turn on an SSH server so that somebody could try to or a Telnet service so somebody could try to log in using mm -hmm. your root login and, and blank. So you you yeah you should never leave it blank. That's just because yeah. they figure well it's going to be an eight year old. Yeah, <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to make it hard on them. But no, I, never, I, ever, ever use a, have a blank root password. That's a recipe. I for suppose I could turn off SSH access on the. Uh, yeah, don't allow SSH or Telnet. But you'd have to yeah. normally you'd have to turn that on. I, maybe they leave that on. That would be a not a. Yeah, that would be a vulnerability. Yeah. Now you're getting into this. Like I said, you've got to be a sysadmin. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but that's what's fun about this. You're learning. You're learning an awful lot, right? Actually, actually, I must admit, uh, I was a Windows Power user for 15, 20 years before I ever touched a Mac. And when I when I learned how to install printer drivers on the Mac after having have it playing with it for about a, two, three months, and saying, "Oh, I'm not now," I know there are generic printer drivers available on Windows. Right? <laughs> it's like it's you, like this learning. is this is fun, isn't it? You're learning all this stuff. Yeah, and now that now that I'm understanding that the Linux kernel and the Linux operating system is the basis of exactly. Mac OS. Yeah, I'm 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 learning more about Windows and Mac systems That's right. by learning Linux. That's right. Learning under the hood is always a good thing. Hey, I got to run. Yeah. Okay. Thank Great you. to talk uh, to you, Don. Good Take care. Uh, get it. Get a Raspberry Pi if anyone wants. I to know learn they're that. awesome, aren't they? Okay. Yeah, Thanks, bye -bye. Don. See ya. Our show today brought to you. All you smart techie people by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Quicken Loans realize that people who watch this show, you guys are unique because you probably want to do everything online. You shop online, right? Right? You read online? Wouldn't you like to, when it's time to buy a home or to refinance your existing home, wouldn't you like to apply for a mortgage online? Now you can, Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. It brings the staid old 19th century mortgage approval process right here into the 21st century into the future it's fast it's powerful it's completely online it's so simple you can share your bank statements and pay stubs with a touch of a button electronically and because it's all electronic with just answer a few simple questions and within minutes you're going to get approved for a loan that's perfect for you because computers right and even better, you don't have to sit down at your desk even. You can do this on your phone. You can do it on your phone or your tablet. You don't have to get up from the couch. Or, and they show this on the video on the site, you can go to an open house, just, you know, a little looky-looing and go, hey, you know what, we should buy this house and apply for the loan right there. Oh, realtor, I'm approved. Go to quickenloans.com slash tech guy and find out more about Rocket Mortgage. By Quicken Loans, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. Quickenloans.com slash tech guy for Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. We thank them for their support of the Tech Guy Show and make it possible 
So all I ask is the next time you're in the market for a new house or you're ready to refi, all I ask is you go to quickenloans.com slash tech guy. That's not hard. Thank you, Rocket Mortgage. Look, look, who's here? Chris Marquardt. He's our photo guy. Joins us every week to talk about digital photography. Hi, Chris. Hi there. How are you? I am great. Welcome to the show. You'll find Chris's site, discoverthetopfloor.com. He leads lots of photographic workshops, and he's such a wonderful photographer. Always an inspiration. What should we talk about today? I brought another secret superpower Yay! for photographers. And then this is a, this is one that I've lately seen more often than than just a few years ago, and that is how do I take sharp images? How do I create sharp images? And I think the reason. Why people ask that is that they are shooting with higher resolutions these days. Oh. You know, if you have a if you have a camera with twelve megapixels, then the shake in your camera or whatever causes the unsharpness is not as bad as if you shoot, let's say, with a thirty or a thirty-six or a fifty megapixel camera, and because then all the individual pixels are so much smaller, so you just the tiniest movement of the camera will already introduce some unsharpness. So. You kind of have to retrain yourself a bit in the way how you shoot. And um, so th th there are three things that I want to talk about, three reasons why pictures might not be very sharp and how to counter those. First is during the shooting, then after the shooting and post-processing. Those are all technical reasons. And then there's one about perception. So let's start with during the photography. Obvious. I mean, the, the real obvious thing is camera shake, right? You want to hold the camera steady uh, if you... Uh, if you can use a higher shutter speed or a shorter shutter speed so that the, you don't have so much time to move the camera while it takes the picture. Um, so that's that's really obvious. The second is focus. If you learn how to focus well, the camera might just make a, a bad choice. You know, you want to take a picture of someone and next to him there is something with a lot of contrast. The camera catches onto that and, uh, and then a face is out of focus. So that is another reason for... Uh, lack of sharpness. Uh, sometimes it helps to learn to control where you put this little focus point on your camera and just put it where you want the focus to be. If you have a camera with a touchscreen, very often it's just tapping on the touchscreen to put the focus where it needs to be. Uh, and the third is depth of field. If you control the depth of field, that's that's when parts of the image are out of focus, like behind your subject, something goes out of focus. Um, if you shoot with very shallow depth of field, if you shoot with a very what we call a large aperture, then that depth of field gets so tiny that sometimes you want to focus on the eyes, but you actually focus on the tip of the nose and the eyes already go out of focus. So that's that's during the shooting. Then in post-processing, we're looking at some stuff that can increase the sharpness or the perceived sharpness of your pictures, and that is well, sharpening. There is a little slider that's called sharpening, and that will raise uh, the it won't really make the picture sharper. It will make it seem sharper because it will raise the contrast at edges like oh. between something bright and something dark. The contrast goes a bit higher. Uh, if you use something like Lightroom, you will have a clarity slider, which again adds a bit of local contrast. It's easy to overdo. Be careful with these things. Uh, so that's the second thing in post-processing. You can just add this little bit of sharpness, but it is... It's touchy. If you overdo it, pictures will kind of look fake and digital again. But here's here's the third thing, and that is really kind of, uh, I think, the key. I have a lot of pictures that I shot that aren't really that tech sharp on a on a per pixel level. If you zoom in all the way, you don't you see that they are not really super sharp. But people still go, wow, that's a sharp picture. And one of the reasons is that they have good contrast between the foreground and the background. So you you don't really have a problem telling apart the the background and where the where the subject starts in the picture, and the second is what we call edge contrast. If you have a light source that comes from behind something, you will all of a sudden have a little bit of light on someone's hair, on just on the edge, a little bit of light on the shoulder, and that kind of a backlight source will create an edge that is going to be perceived as more sharpness because it creates that additional contrast at the edges. And I mean, you know that, you don't know that, Leo, in, in the studio, that's a very normal way to light yeah. someone in the studio. Yeah. You have a bit of a light coming from above and behind. They call just it hair to, lights. 
the hair lights or, or shoulder lights or edge lights, they, they will do exactly that. They will create this additional bit of contrast at the edges, which will make um, people who look at it go, oh, wow, that's a sharp picture. And it doesn't really have to be that sharp from a technical point of view, but the, the added contrast at the edges will make the picture look sharper. Mm. So the light actually, I would say about 50% of what you see as sharpness is in the lighting. It's in you where look, the light I was just going to say how sharp you look today. Oh, do I? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's a different it's kind excellent of excellent lighting. That's very yeah, good lighting. Yeah. You got. I, sh I shaved, you know. <laughs> you have perfect lighting for radio. I do. I do have. I actually do have a light source on this side of the screen. If anyone's watching on video, if you look this way, there's a light source coming from the side that is adding a bit of a yeah, shine on the yeah. side of my face, which adds this contrast. And uh, if I turn this, is that this one? Uh, Oh, now my Figures remote control doesn't work. Lighting. If I turn it, if I turn it off, that additional bit of sharpness yeah, goes away. Goes away. Yeah, if I right. turn it oh, on, you're right. It all of a wow. sudden comes back. That was a dramatic demonstration on the radio. On the radio, just doesn't imagine, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking at video because Chris uses Skype video when he calls, and it really did make a difference. That's very interesting. So we think it's sharp, but it's really lighting. It's often lighting, and it's really about the light that doesn't come straight at you, but it might come from the side or slightly from behind will make a difference. So next time you take a picture of someone, maybe at a window, don't put them so the window shines straight in their face, but maybe put them so the window, kind of the light from the window hits right. their side and maybe slightly from behind, and that I, will def definitely make a difference. I don't like flat lighting, and I guess that's what you would call flat lighting. When you're lit straight on, it flattens everything out a little bit. Or, or if you're shooting under a very overcast sky, it, light comes from everywhere pretty much. As, as soon yeah. as we have j nothing but clouds in the sky, light comes from everywhere. And then there's a good chance that it won't be as exciting as if you have some directionality right. in the light. Right. We, we have to remember that photography means writing with light, that it's about the light. Yes. Uh, re light reflected off the thing you're photographing, but the light really makes a difference. Uh, it does. Overall. The direction of the light, the size of the light source... And yeah, sharpness. we don't control it very much. So you have to arrange people and look where the light's coming from. You know, I love the single windows to the side. I love the light coming in, filtering in through a window. That really can give you yeah, a beautiful effect. I think that's that's a bit what, what makes a photographer. At least part of it is to, if you come into a room, if I come to, into a room, I look around yeah. where the light's coming from. What's yeah. what's there, what we call available light. And then I, I will decide if I want to shoot some some portrait that okay move over there that's a good spot turn yep. a bit around let's try this and yep. uh, try a few different things and yeah the, our assignment the, this week you can use this uh, during your assignment uh, is to take a picture illustrating the word concept idea square right yes that's still the assignment all right uh, take take that picture upload it to Flickr submit it to the tech guy group make sure you put the word square in the comment on the picture so that we'll know it's a submission. And in a few weeks, Chris is going to look at a bunch of them on the air. Pictures on the radio. You'll find Chris Marquardt at discoverthetopfloor.com. That's where his photos are, his books, and of course his workshops. Really great workshops. I, he's a fantastic teacher, as I think you can tell. Thanks, Chris. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. Thank you, sir. I still carry my Loom Cube with me, but it's, that's, yeah, there's stuff you can do with that. That certainly helps with a um, camera which, phone. Which, well, you don't know about which that? Which is that? Oh, it's so cool. Wait a minute, I'll show you. How do you spell it? It's small enough to fit in my man bag. Oh, it's a, it's a light. Yeah, it's a light. It's a tiny it's little, a battery, yeah, of course I know. USB yeah, yeah, battery, yeah. It's uh, a light, and so it's just one. But it's still, uh, you know, it could be helpful. Well, you, and and if you take it off and put it somewhere on the side, well, put it the, up on a shelf yeah, or something. Actually, yeah. yeah, so let me. Because because most people will think I have to. Well, I think it does come with a, with a tripod thread, so you it does. you kind of kind of want to put it on top of the camera, and that's not really where it belongs. <laughs> I got too much stuff in my purse. <laughs> Here it is at the very bottom. So it's small, <laughs> right? Is it and charged? It does, it have a, of course it's charged. It has a thread, uh, as you said, but you don't have to use the thread. You can just turn it on, and it's really oh, bright. If you, That's if, a flash, you, so you could tie it to Bluetooth, or you turn it on, and uh, then you, you see. see. 
Now that's a little too bright, <laughs> but you'd yeah, have to point, point it at your face from below. Make make it. Oh yeah, horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> but, at the um, campfire, <laughs> but you can you can play with it to give it a, a, effects and stuff, that's, and it does have different point. settings. You know, if you hold your camera on the right hand, you can hold that in the left hand and move it around and see what it does on the face of your subject. Yeah, yes. yeah, just try different, and it's perfect for a camera phone because it's small enough, and you just, I it, the color is daylight. I think it's very blue, so uh, you have to consider that also, but. Better than a flash. A, you could get an orange gel and put it on uh, there you, you tape can. It to the front. You know, so this is the trick. The sample gels that you order to see if what gels look like are exactly the right size for this. So you, ah, can, get free, that, yeah. you can get a free gel kit just by ordering all the samples. Uh, actually true. And then and then you have like a couple hundred different gels of different colors. Yeah, I have yeah. one of those kits. Yeah. So yeah. it's got a variety of settings. That's the bright. Oh, there's the bright. Oh, whoa. I think you should keep it gets quite that bright. bright exactly the way it is for the rest of the show. <laughs> Just put it down. It's there. a good eye light, right? <laughs> wow. With I'll with the shadow of the microphone in your face. Yeah, that's yes. good. Welcome yeah. to creature feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's a little too bright. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is cool though. It's not very expensive. The Loom Cube. Yeah, but it's I can't. It's, it's, it's a and fun it, little toy. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's got a, a micro USB charging thing. So you just, I don't charge it very often, but because you know it doesn't use much juice, it's LED. So there you go. Yeah. There you go. Back into my man bag with you. All right. All right. Thank you, Chris. See you again next week. We'll see you later. Bye bye. Take care. I'm kind of blinded. Blinded by the light, by the loom cube. It strobes, uh, yes, and you can use the loom app on your camera phone and tie, pair it via Bluetooth. I've never used it that way. So then you can have it as a flash, which is wild, right? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. <laughs> Ask Leo, very appropriate choice by Michael Cozia. Blinded by the light, I shined that we were talking about that flash, the loom cube. Have I talked to you about that? This is a little cube about the size of an ice cube, but it has a very, very bright LED light that you can use as a kind of a, a light, just like Chris was talking about. As you go around, you could it works with a camera phone or any kind of works good with it. Well, works well. I've lost my four years of college for nothing. Well, two and a half years. Uh, it, it works well with uh, camera phone because you can use uh, the Loom Cube app on the phone to trigger it. So it's like a flash. Or you just turn it on and blind your subject because it is it is very, very, very bright. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. And next, Joanne from Temecula. Hi, Joanne. Hey, Leo. How are you? I am well. How are you? Fine, just listening to everybody, and I'll try to make this quick. I um, I've spoke with you before. Um, the if you if you get this notice that says that your disc is full, and then I try to go back in and and dump things, and I can't. It's not coming out, and I'm not getting. I'm, I'm still getting these messages, and I go to settings, and then I look up um, the the. C drive and the recovery drive, and um, they're full. So I don't know what yeah. I'm doing wrong. Well, um, what the the first thing we want to find out is what it is that's filling that all up. So um, are, yeah, I take it it's Windows. Yes. Yeah. So uh, there are a number of programs you can use on Windows that will actually give you a graphical display of what's using up space. And I always tell people about these programs because they're a very easy. Uh, way to understand um, what uh, is what the big blobs are, and there are some big blobs that are too big, uh, but that you can't delete. Things like uh, your pa Windows uh, page file, you don't want to delete that. You can't delete that. Uh, but there, there are some blobs that you just really go, well, I don't. What do I have? Eight hundred you know, videos for. So the one that I would recommend is free. It's called Windirstat, W-I-N-D-I-R, 
S T A T, and it gives you a, a colorful graphical display of files on your drive by type. So all the red files will be movie files, all the blue files will be audio files, things like that. And, and then sorts it to the biggest blobs so you can see what type of files you're using up space. That might be helpful. Okay. There is a, uh, of course, uh, Windows has its disk cleanup utility, but I, my susp I bet you use that already, or no? Have you tried that yet? Um, that's yeah, that's the one yeah. that I I, right. I go. Well, I just go into settings and um, it says the storage use, and then it shows me a little graph of yeah, storage. and then you can use disk cleanup. But all that deletes is temp files, cache files, and that may not be aggressive enough. So um, that's Windows built-in disk cleanup. Um, but it's certainly worth doing it. You can look at any drive, and uh, in the drive properties, there'll be a button that says disk cleanup, and you can try that. Uh, but I, when I do that, and it, and, and it doesn't seem to do yeah, anything. Yeah, because it's not very aggressive. Okay. So now we need to get more aggressive. And that's why WinDurstead, I think, is very useful because it, you, you know, is it, do you save videos on your hard no, drive? No, not well. You mean from my not not anything I download, <laughs> not movies, no, but your own videos. Then they may yeah. be taking up more space than you realize. I guess that's it. Um, there were, you know, there could be other things. There are every once in a while there are programs that uh, save huge temp files and forget to delete them and things like that. But all of that will be revealed, I believe, by Windurstat. So okay, now, will I be able to delete things? Yeah, it has a deletion. It also has deletion capability. What is what is the size of your drive? Do you know? Probably I don't. <laughs> <laughs> is it, how old is the computer? Oh, it's probably seven years old Okay. Now. So, in, you know, hard drive sizes have expanded greatly in the last seven years. The typical computer now is sold with a terabyte of, of hard drive space. That's a thousand gigabytes. And... In seven years ago, if you had 500 gigabytes or 250 gigabytes or less even, that wouldn't be unusual at all. So it may merely be that you are using an older computer and that drive really is full. So I would suggest running Windurstat, cleaning up what you can, and if it's still not enough, is it a laptop or a desktop? It's a laptop. A laptop. Most laptops of that vintage, you can replace the hard drive if you want. But I do feel like it's, you know, from if it's seven years old, it probably has a small hard drive, like 256 gigs or 128 gigs. It's not a huge hard drive. So I'm not surprised you filled it up over time. Okay. And and the question is with what? And, and, and once you see what it is, you can decide whether you want to delete it. So should I download my, my pictures and things like that to a... a, a yeah. Like a backup? Yeah, you should be backing up anyway, and maybe this is a good time to get an external drive. They're cheap. Literally, a terabyte drive is well under $100, two or three terabytes. You, you know, I mean, they're they're not expensive. Maybe the way you're going to end up doing this is saying you're going you're to use Windurstat and you say, oh, I, don't, I can't lose any of this stuff, in which case you're going to move it off your hard drive. Okay. All right. Yeah, then, it's just um, you have a small drive because it's old. Yeah, what's a reasonable printer out there these days that I should be looking for? I need to replace my printer as well. Well, you're going to want a printer these days that is Wi-Fi capable, right? So you don't have to physically hook your computer up to it. That's nice, especially with a laptop, because you can be anywhere in the house and print. Right. So that's the first thing I'd look for. Our sponsor, Epson, makes some very good wireless printers the epson artisan printers are great the uh, and of course we talk about the the big boy printers that are all in ones and if you have a home office and you do copying or you no. want to scan then that's nice but for most people yeah all you need is a simple printer um yeah, yeah epson canon there are lots of companies hp make inexpensive printers uh that are good for you know occasional use just look for one that has wireless networking that really makes right. a big difference all right. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank Should, you so much. You probably don't need to spend more than 150 bucks on the printer. Be aware, though, that the reason the printers are cheap is that the ink is expensive. <laughs> in fact, if you do a quick Google search on expendable costs for inkjet printing, you'll see that there's a great, big variety in how much per page different manufacturers' inkjets can cost. Uh, and it depends mostly on how much they charge for the ink. So you're going to want to look for one that has a low expendable cost. Uh, you know, 
somewhere around five cents, four cents a page is, is good. Anything more than that, it's too expensive. Often, they practically give you the printers knowing they're going to make it up with the ink. Uh, let's see. I got a minute. Maybe, maybe we could start with Arvind, and then uh, I have a feeling, Arvind, I'm going to have to put you on hold through the top of the hour and finish the question. Hi, Arvind. Welcome. Austin, Texas. Hello, Mr. Leo. How nice to you? talk to you. I'm great. How are you? One of my favorite cities in the time. country. I love Austin. Yes, sir. I love Austin, too. Yeah. Long-time listener since almost 1998. Wow. I listen to your podcast all the time. Oh, bless you. Thank since you so much. Day. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about SMS messages. I mean, the text messages that they send to you, the bank. Yeah, to your my bank does that phone. too, right? I get, a, I log on and says, right. okay, what's your phone number? We're going to send you a text message. That right. is not secure, but we have to break now. So I'm going to leave you hanging for a moment, okay? A little yeah, tease. No we'll talk about the potential problems of text-based authentication. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out... Ba, 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 bum. Sorry, Harvin, I had to do that, but it but it's a great question and actually be a great way to lead off the hour. So if you can hang on for about five minutes, I appreciate it. You've been hanging on forever anyway, so thank you, Arvind. Features an amazing refillable ink tank. We just got one. It's amazing. Yeah, a seven year old in the box laptop. Gosh, let's see, seven years two thousand nine. Yeah, probably 250 gigs or less, right? And Tergos is, is really nice. Uh, elementary is trying too hard to look like um, Mac OS. But Entergos is very nice. One of the reasons I like it, it is installs a plain old arch once it's done. But it um, it's very good about getting the drivers in, the, even the non-free drivers. So it's worked on a huge variety of hardware um, and, and installed very nicely. And Arch has a couple of benefits. One is the Arch Wiki, which is even if you didn't use Arch, would be a huge benefit. Um, but uh, it's a it's a nice rolling distro. I think it's a really good rolling distro. The people who use Arch tend to be fairly sophisticated, so the answers are very good out there. I am very disappointed. In fact, maybe I'll t I should do a little sermon on this. After talking to Kyle Weens of uh, iFixit about the new MacBook, it is not only completely not repairable in any fashion without just replacing massive chunks of it. The USB port goes bad on it, the, uh, the Type-C port. You have to buy a whole new logic board, which will cost 1000 or more. But it's also completely not recyclable. Yeah, I'm I'm getting more and more I think that the next the thing I want I think everybody should do now is only buy electronics with removable batteries. Um because it when they're glued in like that it makes them unrecyclable. And uh so phones, everything, you know, but the problem is everybody's putting these batteries glued in now because it makes it thinner. Yeah, the, I, was the LG V20, is, the, is that, the, it's like the only flagship phone with a removable battery now. And laptops, jeez. You're tuned to Premier Channel 7. Leo Laporte, yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? So the issue Kyle was talking about is recyclers can't get the lithium ion out batteries out easily. And so they can't grind them up because it'll cause a fire. And I just, I'm starting to believe that this is really uh, bad for the environment and for us because replacing the battery is a way to keep stuff lasting longer. No, what did they do? <laughs> After the Yale Harvard game, did they go wild? Did they go crazy? Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, and text message authentication. Arvin's very patient. Thank you for hanging on from Austin, Texas. So your bank does what many do. 
Uh, you log in with your name and password, and then it says, okay, and to verify it's you, we're going to have, this is called two-factor authentication. We're going to send you a text message, usually with a six-digit code, which you'll then enter to verify that it's you. And the reason this yeah. is more secure is because, well, there's, so the, the fundamental problem is authentication. How do you prove you are who you say you are? And we've seen a lot of ways to do this. But it all boils down, according to security gurus, to three ways to do it. Something you know, something you have, or something you are. So let me explain what those three things are. Something you know is a password. It's in your head. So we've been using that, but that's only one factor. If you could make it two or three factors, you'd be more secure, right? Because a bad guy might guess your password, but he might not have this second or third factor. So something you have originally usually meant a dongle, right? Banks and uh, secure facilities would give out uh, like the Bloomberg terminals, they give you a credit card sized number generator that every 30 seconds generates a new six digit number. And in order to get into a Bloomberg terminal, you have to have the password and the authentication. And that's really much more secure. Something you are is biometrics, fingerprint, iris scan, pupil scan, that kind of thing. And if you combine all three, and there are secure facilities. I imagine the Pentagon has a few of them, but even uh, my friend Steve Gibson, who runs his servers at, uh, with a company called Level One, he says to get into my servers, uh, my, the network operations center, I need to do a password, I need to do a hand scan, and I need to have a card key. That's all three, something you know, have, and are. So the bank wants to make it more secure, and a text message is a good way of doing it because the theory is, well, he has to have that cell phone for this to work. Here's the problem. It's unfortunately way too easy for a bad guy to spoof your cell phone. And there are a couple of ways to do this. You can clone a phone, but more commonly, they call your company, <laughs> your phone company, and they say, uh, hi, this is uh, Arvind. I don't know what happened. I, I, I lost my phone and I need a new SIM card. Could you, can I, can I just come in and get one or could you mail one to me? And they mail a SIM card that has, that's your phone number on that SIM card. And if the bad guy can get that, then he can, he can actually start intercepting your text messages. Now, I'd still need your password. So, in my opinion, this is still better than just password alone. But recently, the National Institute for uh, NIST, Standards and Technology or Standards and Time, uh, NIST mm -hmm. sent out a bulletin warning banks that National Institutes of Standard and Technology, government run, uh, and they uh, sent out a, a warning about SMS authentication, saying it's it's to be avoided. It's no longer recommending. Uh, actually, actually, my question was a little different. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I went on and on. No, that's, that's okay. No, no, that's okay. okay. That's, a, what, that's good information. What's your question? Um, what happens is um, I have my bank accounts in India as well as uh, now I'm uh, in States, so I have accounts here. Yeah. Uh, my OTP, when my U.S. bank sends me an OTP, I don't have any problem. But when well, OTP is a one-time yeah. password, a password that can only right. be used one once. One-time passwords, right, right. So banks in India, whenever I want to say like uh, funds transfer or pay my bill, uh, they want to send me an OTP. And obviously, I do not have the cell phone service that I have in India right here in U.S. So they can't so send can't it to you. OTP. Yeah. Right. So is there, my question was, is there any way that you can register different phone numbers in, say, like, for example, different countries and receive your text messages over there? I am. I, I apologize, Arvind. Oh, no. <laughs> I, did, oh, no. I, did, I answered the wrong question. I should have listened better. No, that's all right. <laughs> so you know, and of course it's very popular in India, there, make, there are cell phones that have dual SIM slots. Right. So uh, the OnePlus 3, for instance, has a dual SIM slot. So you could bring your Indian SIM. Uh, the problem is it wouldn't work in the U.S., wouldn't it? Would it? Because you, exactly. it's That's a different the carrier. Yeah. So the, the reason you have them in India is because you, there are many different carriers. And as you travel, 
you would use as mm-hmm. the SIM card for the carrier whose region you're in. But that's not going to solve the problem here in the U.S. Um, and it, will an Indian bank accept a non-Indian phone number? Uh, actually, that's the problem. They don't. They say like, okay, it's your Indian account, and you have, you have to have a phone number from Indian India. phone number, right? Are so the real question is, how can I get this Indian phone number to work in the U.S.? Right. Uh, uh, one way would be to have this to... have this Indian phone, and before you leave India, right. forward that number. Okay. That would work with phone calls. Can you get them to call you with the OTP? Uh, not really. They, they use, has to be text uh, messaging. Right. Okay. Text messaging. So text well, messaging. Some of, use, some of them can use like email, but not most of them. Right. You know? That's, this is a very interesting question. So what you need an Indian phone number that will work with, in the U.S. Can, now, um... Do they verify that it's an Indian phone number solely by the country code? Yes, 91. So if if you had a phone that could accept a call to that 91 country code in the U.S., that would work? A uh, call as in, like, text message. Yeah, not the yeah call SMS, call. I understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what you need is a service in India <laughs> that will forward text messages right. to an American right. number. Yes. That's an interesting this question. Is not a, this is, yeah, this is not a basically a problem between India uh, and U.S. This is like across the country. Say you have a phone number in, say, Africa or South Africa somewhere, and you are traveling mm-hmm. for a project in the U.S. or something like that. It still is a problem. There are digital phone services. So, you know, something like Google Voice, if it worked in India, might be one solution. You get a Google Voice number that has a, an, an Indian uh, country code, 91, and then Google Voice right. allows you to use Hangouts with it and forward it. You could probably, right. I wonder if WhatsApp or something like that might work as well. Would they use WhatsApp or no? It has to be carrier SMS. Oh, uh, they don't use WhatsApp. They won't uh, let you because, do that. Uh, yeah. No. No. For this very reason. Your text message. <laughs> yeah, for this very reason. Um, this is a this is actually a pretty good form of authentication. They're saying, no, no, you got to have a 91 a country code, or we're not going to send it right. to you. Well, I, you know, so I I think the question is going to be to find a service that's like Google Voice, but that would allow you to set up an Indian phone number that could be f- that texts to which could be forwarded to a U.S. number or a U.S. service. So if you had, for instance, Google Voice availability in India, you would get an Indian number from Google Voice, and then you would just say, whenever I get a text or a call to that Indian number, make sure you forward it to this phone. And that would work. Uh, I do that with Google Voice all the time. I have a number that's in Baltimore. It's not quite India, but I have a number that's in Baltimore. And when text messages get sent to it, it's automatically forwarded to five different phones of mine because I'm always using a different phone. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not sure which services will do this. I use a service that's like Google Voice called Anvio, A N V E O. You can get, go to Anvio and buy a phone number. I don't know what countries they support, but if they support India, they would, this would work. Okay. A N V E O dot com. And I'm going to keep listening. Uh, and see if I can find another service like that that will have an Indian phone number, a 91 area uh, country code, that will forward to a U.S., a 01 country code phone number, because that would solve the problem. Keep listening, Arvid. We'll, we'll find an answer for you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. So Anvio is a really interesting company. It's way... Uh, too complicated for uh, a lot of people. I think it's global. So I uh, I use it yeah, 48 countries. Let's see if one of the countries is India. Geographic phone numbers in Canada, UK, and United States can receive SMS text messages. It's basically a SIP uh, digital phone service. So, no India. Dang it. (laughs) 
So, but it would, but this is the premise here, right? I can get a Colombian phone number from them that would forward f f text messages to my U.S. number. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't see India on this list. I see Ireland, I see Israel, I see Italy, I see Japan and Latvia and Lithuania. But there must be something like this, right? You see, this has so many countries. Now, it's not cheap, but so, for instance, I have a phone number through this company, and then once you have a phone number, you can build a call tree that is just... Oh, I should log in and show you. I mean, this thing is, this thing is wild. I don't know if I... Let me see if I can show you my phone tree without showing you my special phone number. I never use this um, <laughs> because... It's too complicated. But I, the idea was to use this instead of Google Voice because it can do everything Google Voice can do and then some. So there's going to be another company like this that will let you get a uh, Indian uh, phone number and forward it to a U.S. phone. Text to uh, email will not work because they want to text it to a voice, to a, to a number, right? So you can't give them an email address that goes to you. It goes the other way around, you know, email to text, not text to, not SMS to email. Um, I'll show you. Let's see if I can show you my um, my, my uh, PBX setup because it's crazy. Okay, so I can show you this without showing you my phone number. So this is <laughs> you build this with a graphical interface. You drag these features over, and this is my call flow, okay? It's crazy, and this isn't even that complicated. <laughs> but you get an idea, right? It's crazy talk, man, crazy. Is there Magic Jack in India? Yeah, I think there's a reason why you, they can't get an Indian number exactly right, because the Indian government controls it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, I just checked out Anvio, which is a service I use uh, for kind of very sophisticated call flow management. And it, it, it works in 90 countries. You can get a phone number in 90 countries except India. Not India. And I think the problem is that the Indian government really keeps a lid on this. And I suspect that that's just... But maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just Anvio doesn't do business in India. So what I would look for is something like Anvio, A-N-V-E-O.com, which is a kind of a digital call center that offers a phone number in the 91 country code. Somebody's saying Magic Jack does operate in India. So if you got a Magic Jack with a 91 country code Indian number, but see, the problem is he needs what he needs is the bank. He needs to give that number to the bank. Say, this is my cell phone. And the bank then texts the one-time password to his phone. That number then forwards the SMS message to his U.S. phone. Hmm. Hmm. Anvia would do it if it worked in India, but it doesn't. Somebody said, you need a friend in India. Just have him text that phone and have him call you. <laughs> I don't, yeah. It's real. It's a good puzzle. I like that. I like to have uh, some challenges. If you have a suggestion, 8888-ASK-LEO. You could also get in our chat room, irc.twit.tv. Those nice people in the chat room are my, my externalized brains. Team tech guy. They're brilliant. They, uh, they, uh, they, they answer many of the questions, but uh, this one has stumped them, I think, a little bit, too. Uh, or you can go to the website, techguylabs.com, and leave a comment. Techguylabs.com is free. It's open. Just no sign-up. I don't want your money. You don't want your email address. Just go there, and you can see everything from every show, 1,342 shows. Questions, answers. We even put audio and video there after the show in case you miss it. Uh, and you can comment. Now, unfortunately, to prevent spam, we do require a sign-up for commenting. The email address doesn't go to me. It goes to a service called Discus, which runs the, the commenting section. It's a third-party commenting service. But they keep the spam out of there, which is very handy for us. Uh, and, and they don't, you know, your privacy is protected. So leave a comment if you've got an idea. See if you can find that. Caller 1 in Hour 3 of episode 1,342. 
Uh, country code. Um, look, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the chat room does have an answer. Crucial Wax in the chat room says countrycode.org says they have virtual phone numbers for India. There you go. Countrycode.org. Moving on to Brett in Woodbridge, New Jersey. Hello, Brett. Hello, Leo. I have a Dell Venue 83830 model, and I'm looking for a custom ROM because I'm out of warranty and I'm having a lot of problems with the performance of the tablet. So I was wondering, because I did three hours of research yesterday trying to find a custom ROM or even if I can get a higher version of Android, because right now it's only running 4.42. So is there any way... So anytime you want to you want to uh, uh, put a f custom firmware on an Android device, the first place uh, you want to go is the XDA Developers Forum, xda-developers.com. They are amazing, and you can literally look up the unit that you want to re replace the ROM on, and if such ROMs exist. Uh, it will be, they will have it there and they'll have step-by-step -step instructions. So this is actually a, a, a good topic because uh, it's something that many people with older Android devices uh, might want to do. It, you say Dell no longer supports that venue and you'd like to have a more modern version of Android on it. Well, the way you do it is by first rooting that device. Now, rooting a Android device is easy on some, hard on others, impossible on others still. It just depends on the manufacturer. I don't know how Dell feels about rooting, but you know many manufacturers, Motorola, uh, Google itself, are completely fine with you rooting it. Android doesn't prevent rooting. Rooting means merely, I want to be a full super user. I want to be the admin of this phone. Normally, you're not for security reasons, but if you can root it, now that's the first step to putting a custom ROM on it. The next thing you'll do is you'll replace... The what they call the recovery ROM. Just like on a PC, you've got this BIOS that loads first or the setup that loads first. The recovery ROM is the thing that loads before the operating system. And with the ROM, the recovery ROM that came with the venue, you can only do one thing, load the venue firmware. But once you root the phone, you can put different recovery ROMs on there, like Torp is a very popular one, or Clockwork. Once that's on there, then... You've got complete control of the phone, and you can download and install a variety of ROMs, whatever's compatible with that venue. So Marsworm in the chat room has done a little Googling for me. He, he found on the XDA Developers Forum a Dell venue section. But make sure when you take the instructions and get the software, you get it for that model. That's the case. You know, sometimes people say, well, I have a Galaxy S7. Well, there's 12 different versions of Galaxy S7s. And for every region of the world. And so you have to have the software that's right for that exact model by number. So uh, I would, I would, uh, I think XDA developers is, if they don't know or if they say it's not possible, it's not possible. And if it is possible, they will know. XDA developers.com. They're great, Brett. Uh, and this is, you know what? This is one of those things where I should probably give you the warning. You know, if you do it wrong, you can brick your tablet and suddenly it's no longer usable. You understand that. And at this point, uh, you know, it's old enough. You're probably saying, well, I don't care. I just want to make it useful. I'd love to get a more modern version of Android on it, for instance. Um, and so that's when you do that. You probably don't want to do it to a brand new tablet. I would <laughs> do, it, do it to an expendable tablet. John in Illinois, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, John. Hey, Leo. Happy holidays. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. I got a uh, Motorola E, and I've got some apps on my phone that show up when I go to settings and apps, and, you know, you go to yeah. all the all your shows all the apps, yeah. I've got, like, a file manager. It shows it's not disabled. But, but it doesn't show up in the applications drawer. So how do I <laughs> make it appear? <laughs> I tried to disable it. And enable thing is going to pop up. Yeah, it may. It just may not have a user interface to it, or it may be a different name. It may be called Downloads. Do you have Downloads? Some some Android devices have Downloads, which is really a file manager, but it's a, a window to the uh, Downloads thing. There is stuff on every Android device that doesn't have a user facing uh, interface. It may show up in apps. Usually, those are named Com dot something dot something, but 
Sometimes it might just be look like a normal app, but it just doesn't have a user facing interface. Um, Isn't that usually normal? They always put a file manager on there. Uh, yeah, but if you so there are lots of great file managers that I would recommend anyway. Um, I use Astro, uh, but I I recently saw a thread on Reddit that had some uh, really good recommendations for other file managers. Um, let's see, Astro is the one I use. Let me just look through my Android devices because I installed a couple of these. Uh, and there's some really good file managers out there. Many of them are free. There's a, at least one that's open source, which is what I would recommend. Tell you what, when we, I'll look for it, and when we come back, I'll, I'll give you the name of an open source file manager that works on uh, Android phones. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, what's the name of that? Yep. Thank you. I read a great Reddit thread because ES, ES files became unusable. You know, this used to be a great file manager and they just added all sorts of junk on top of it to make money. So everybody's saying, well, what do I use instead of ES file manager? Is it FX? Maybe it's FX. That's one of them. There's one that's open source. Yeah, ES, just they just ruined it. I don't know if I installed it on here. I might have installed it on... Uh... Oh, Amaze. So Amaze is a very easy one to use. Amaze File Manager. I think Amaze is open source. That's the one I've got installed. Play.goggle.com. There's no such thing as that. There we go. Apps. Let me see if this is a Maze File Manager, Team Amaze. Yeah, this is the one that's open source. So, and it's free, and it's pretty sweet. It's very simplistic, however, but I think for a lot of people, this is, uh, this is a good choice. Um, and then, uh, what was the, uh, there were some other ones similar. Let's see what's similar. Was it Explorer? You know, it's so funny. Superfile, maybe there are. These are all file managers. So, frankly, these are any of these are going to be better than any built-in file manager on any Google phone. But I would try a maze. That's that's my my favorite. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number, last half hour of the show. Oh, my gosh, we're just running out of time. I hate that when that happens. Uh, Cesar in Los Angeles is next. Hi, Cesar. <laughs> Welcome. Hello. 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 Hi, Cesar. Welcome. How are you doing today? I am doing great. How are you? Um, I'm actually very really fine. Thank you very much. What do you What do you do with computers these days? Are you a Minecraft fan? Are you maybe you're playing that Undertale game? Or actually, I play um, Overwatch. Overwatch. Oh, I like. Uh, yes, it's actually a pretty good game. I like Overwatch. So, uh, what can I do to help you? Um, I was actually wondering, um, because I want to start my own gaming YouTube channel, but I don't know what I need. Like, I have, like, absolutely nothing. I don't have a camera. I don't have a microphone. <laughs> but do you want it? So what kind of videos do you want to do? You want to do, like, kind of how-to videos? Like, here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. Or do you want to do what they call let's play videos, where people watch you as you play the game? Uh, I would like to do let's play videos. Okay. So typically when you do Let's Play, in fact, frequently they don't do it on YouTube. But there is a YouTube gaming channel, but everybody's on Twitch.tv, right? Um, but by the way, how old are you? Um, I am 14 years old. Okay, good. Because 13, you know, because of the Child Online Protection and Privacy Act, or COPPA, companies aren't allowed to gather information about kids under 13 without parental permission. So none of these services really will let you do anything unless you're over 13. Good news, you are. So that's that's step one. Um, a Let's Play video is harder to do because what you want to do is record your gameplay and often a picture of you inset into the gameplay while you're talking. Is that the kind of video you're thinking of? Yes. Yeah. So most people use, uh, for that 
use something called OBS, the Open Broadcaster Software. But you do need a camera. It says you don't have a camera. You said you don't. Now, your computer doesn't have a camera? Uh, no, it's a custom PC, actually. Okay. So um, you might need to spend... OBS is free. OBS Studio is free. Good news. But And you can find that, by the way, at obsproject.com. OBS stands for Open Broadcaster Software. And it lets you do both live uh, or recording. So you could stream live on Twitch or, or YouTube, or you could record it, which sounds like what you want to do, and uh, and then save it out and put it up on YouTube. If you want a camera, and this will support a camera, you can have a little inset of you sitting there playing the game. Uh, a good choice right now, uh, big sale going on for the Logitech C920. And that is an excellent USB webcam. Uh, gives you very good image quality. In fact, a lot of gamers uh, use this. Normally it's 100 bucks, but I think Logitech, I saw somewhere, is about to have a sale for Black Friday of $50. $50. So if you can get a, you know, get a paper route <laughs> and scrape together $50, then uh, this would probably be the best bet for you. At that price, that's a remarkably good camera. It has a microphone built into it, uh, very crystal clear, and it works, of course, with OBS, so you could easily... Uh, embed that into your video stream so that people could watch you play. And you could do it, as I said, live or after the fact. Are, are you going to do Overwatch, or what game are you going to do? Um, I'm planning to do various games, like Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, Overwatch, maybe yeah. Minecraft. Also. One of the reasons people um, often use Xbox for this is because Xbox has this capability built in, the Xbox One. Uh, and you could use a Kinect camera if you don't have one. Uh, you could buy a camera and uh, and do that. But if you're going to do it on a PC, it sounds like you're doing it on a PC, right? Yes. Yeah. You, you're going to need to, if you want a camera, you don't have to have a camera. A lot of Let's Play videos is just you talking. Oh, but that does mean you'll need a microphone. And there are lots of inexpensive USB microphones Um the, a good quality microphone makes a big difference. Probably you've watched Let's Play videos where the people sound like they're kind of over here in the other corner of the room doing the video. You don't want that. You want to sound right next to the microphone. So getting a good microphone would be a, a good idea. But you want one that's USB. That means you don't have to have any special interface. The microphones we use here and in most broadcast situations will not, cannot just be plugged into a computer. They, uh, they have to be plugged into a mixer, and then the mixer can be plugged into the computer. So look for a USB mic. Blue makes some very good ones. B-L-U. Um, they may be, a, I'm, I'm not sure. They may be a little pricey. You'll find them online at blumic.com. Blue mic. Uh, but they're USB mics. They make professional mics. I just bought the blue this is probably more than you want to spend, but I bought, just bought the Blue Raspberry, which is a really good high-quality mic. Uh, Shure also makes some very good uh, computer mics in the Motiv line, M-O-T-I-V. So S-H-U-R-E is the company, M-O-T-I-V. You're going to need a pretty good paper route, though, to get these, uh, these mics. These are actually more expensive <laughs> than the camera I just talked about, if the camera sells for 50 bucks. But the motifs are nice because you can plug them right into a computer, and uh, and uh, they give you a pretty great sound. I'm not sure what the least expensive is. They have a condenser mic for 150 bucks. Um, there's one for 99 bucks. The, the MV5. That's probably as little as you can spend for a good microphone. 99 uh, bucks. Hey, have fun and good luck, Caesar. That sounds like. Something every kid wants to do nowadays. That's the only problem, right? There's, there's some competition. But uh, every everybody wants to do YouTube videos. I think it's a fun thing to do. I like it. I want to encourage you to do it. You'll learn a lot. Sean from Sweet Home. I want to say Alabama, but it's Oregon. Hi, Sean. You, you betcha. Sweet Home, Oregon. Sweet Home, Oregon. Yeah, darn, 7386. <laughs> I got a question here. Yes, sir. Okay, I got, uh, oh, two feet on a banana peel as a uh, skateboard. <laughs> okay, now, 
I want to buy a computer that I know my wife will be able to use. She likes games. Now, well, what games, though, does she like? What kind of games? Uh, she does RPGs a lot. Really? Wow. Oh, okay. yeah. We're trying to keep up with it. Yeah. Is she? Is it like Warcraft-style games? or? Uh, she didn't get into Warcraft, but she's doing... Uh, oh, I have to talk to her. She's trying. Now... The it sounds like, though, this is PC gaming, Windows gaming. Yes, yeah. PC Windows 10. Yeah. What I'm looking for is a rig that's going to outlast us. <laughs> well, I can't promise you it'll outlast you, but I have the feeling that a computer you buy today, if, you, if you're willing to spend a little money anyway, is going to last a good long time. Because what's happening is computer power isn't, isn't improving at anywhere near the rate it used to. It used to be you'd buy a computer be obsolete the day you got it out the door. No, but, but, I, I hear you. Like, you know, I hear, like, Dr. Mom's comments and all that. <laughs> what I'm looking for is... Uh, a twelve to fifteen hundred dollar computer. Oh, that's plenty. And I wanted to sit up and bark when required. <laughs> now, fifteen hundred bucks is a lot more than the bargain basement computers you can see for three and four hundred bucks. A true hardcore gaming machine might cost you twice as much as that, though. So, but fifteen hundred bucks is kind of in the sweet spot. You're going to want a, a, a GeForce. GTX 1060 card. That's the less expensive of the newer uh, video cards, but that should do pretty well by you, and it'll keep it in the budget range. An i5 will be fast enough. Uh, there are certainly companies like Alienware, but let me keep let me look for you, and when we come back, I'll give you a couple of companies. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're out. Alienware might be a little pricey. Let me just see what. Uh, do you, do you care if it's a desktop, uh, Sean, or let me fire yeah. some numbers? Out. It should be a desktop. Yes. Can you reuse your existing monitor, or do you want a new monitor too? I'll use the same one. So that'll I'm save you I'm some money. A bigger one. Well, and maybe maybe for her birthday you'll get her a bigger one. Okay. <laughs> and her birthday's December fourth. <laughs> uh, let me just look. Yeah. So. Alienware, which is a gaming computer company, does in fact have desktop computers. Um, I see a one with pretty good specs, actually, starting at eight hundred bucks. So let me just look. Oh. Let me just look at this here. This is this this is Dell's gaming brand. Uh, and let me see the configuration choices we have here. Okay. Uh, yeah, she so, leaves it on all the time. That's fine. So I thought about that liquid cooling thing. No, you don't need that. Uh, that's more because you have a super fast processor that you overclock. You're not going to be doing that with an RPG. So, okay. for instance, here's the um, Alienware Aurora, which uh, for thirteen hundred bucks, well, let's make it fourteen hundred bucks, has a i7. That's a very fast processor. 8 gigs of DDR4, very fast RAM. It eight's a little low, but not for not for what she's doing. A 1070 card from NVIDIA, that's a very good card. Uh, and that's a great price, $1,399. So I think that would be a, a reasonable thing to look at. Now, Alienware and any, any specifically gaming-focused computer is going to be a little pricier because it's for gaming. But uh, Asus makes a line called the Republic of Gamers line that I also like an awful lot. R O G. Let's just oh. look, let's just look at the R O G. One of the reasons you pay more is because the case design is crazy, crazy. Yeah, I, I, I looked at that. The the other thing is I. Uh, no, I'm willing to spend the money just so she's a happy camper. Well, I don't blame you, but the price you're willing to spend is is enough to get it. Yeah, especially if you're not going to get a monitor, it's enough to get a very nice gaming rig. Does she want it to I, look like a crazy gaming rig, or does she care? I'm on Social Security, so she the monitor is not the big thing. Yeah, it's okay. The one we have keeps giving up because of heat. 
Yeah, no, this is a more modern, well, then this is why you may want to go with Alienware or Republic of Gaming. Those are well-designed machines. They don't need liquid cooling, but they have good cooling in them. And that's going to that's gonna make a big uh, big difference. So, um, like, for well, instance... Can some uh, uh, show notes? Because I'm yeah. in the truck. I'll put, yeah, yeah, I'll put a link to uh, the Republic of Gaming stuff and to the Alienware stuff. This Republic of Gaming G31, for instance, has an advanced thermal system that features 3D vapor chamber technology and dual hidden airflow channels for silent, efficient cooling. In other words, they're paying attention to this kind of stuff. So oh, good. The yeah. other thing I'm looking, I would like to introduce her to uh, VR. Well, that's a good point. And uh, Republic of Gaming and Alienware both have Oculus Ready computers in other words enough horsepower to run a, a vr now that's something you get down the road i would get the vive if you're going to do that the uh, htc vive that's 800 dollars additional so get the computer that can run the vive and both of the ones i just described can and then next year for christmas or birthday get the htc vive you know it'll be a lot better in a year anyway so we'll put this all in the show notes for you, okay? Oh, you are so cool. <laughs> I'm ever cold. Thank you. You're, your wife is going to be very happy. <laughs> oh, I just want to take care of Aren't you a sweetheart? Thank you, Sean. Take care. Wow, that's sweet. That's so sweet. Yep. So I uh, I spent a little more time with Sean on the line. He wants it's so sweet. He wants to make his wife happy. Get her a gaming rig. I recommended two well-known gaming brand names. Dell has its Alienware, and then Asus. And these might even be a better deal. I think they make beautiful gaming rigs in their Republic of Gamer line, ROG line. An Asus ROG would be great. And it, it, if you're willing to spend anywhere from twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars, you should be able to get a very nice system again I, I recommend you get an whatever you get you get a, the gaming relies on a good graphics card and the new nvidia cards the gtx 1060 70 or 80 are very good the 1060 is the budget version of that the 80 is the spare no expense version and that could cost you a lot of money so i'd look at a 1060 or we found a good republic of gaming uh, rig or maybe that was the alienware with a 1070 in it that 1070 would be great he also mentioned he was thinking Maybe I want to turn her on to virtual reality gaming. And the 1070 would be more than adequate to run a virtual reality uh, headset, whether it's the Oculus Rift or my recommended headset, which is the HTC Vive. Thing is, the HTC Vive by itself is 800 bucks, So save that for the birthday for next year. Um, and we'll put a, a number of other uh, manufacturers and recommendations because the chat room's loaded with them, a lot of gamers in there. And we'll put that all on our website, techilabs.com, Sean. Techilabs.com. Uh, Somebody in the chat room is mentioning Razer. They make, uh, I've been using their gaming peripherals for years, including keyboards and mice. They make great computers too. So there are some very good gaming systems out there. Um, you, sometimes you're paying a little more because it's a gaming system. Some of that's just style, right? The cases are fancy looking with lights and stuff. But some of it's also because if they know it's going to be used for gaming, they'll make sure that they have fast memory, they have fast S, uh, uh, hard drives, and most importantly, fast graphics processors. If it's, if it's just a general purpose PC, they may not put the fastest video cards in there because they don't, they're not needed. And then, of course, and Sean was worried about this, they will pay a lot of attention to cooling because uh, gaming is very challenging on the CPU and the graphics card. So a, a rig that's designed for gaming and it's a well from a well-known company was going to give you maybe not liquid cooling necessarily. You don't necessarily need that, but they'll give you a system that is well cooled. So you want a big, you know, and oh, and a bigger power supply. That's right. They remind me in the chat room, bigger power supply too to drive that GPU and to drive that CPU and to drive the fans. So there's some really good stuff. The Razer Blade Pro is another one. So Republic of Gaming from Asus. Razer, R-A-Z-E-R's Blade Pro, and uh, which is a good name, isn't it, if you're a company called Razer? And then the uh, Dell's Alienware line. They're all good. They're all good. And, boy, you're going to have a lot of fun. 
Tony in Fontana, California is next. Hi, Tony. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Good talking with you. Good to talk to you. What can I do for you? Uh, I'm looking at a Samsung, the 18.1 tablet that's coming out soon. Yeah, that's big, isn't it? Yeah. Woo! What? That's uh, a big, yeah, it's pretty good size. That's a big tablet. Uh, you, have you read anything up on it? I have not played with it yet. Um, I think the Samsung Galaxy tablets are very good tablets. Um, this yeah. is a good price. So what you're getting for, you're paying for the size, because that's as big almost as a computer monitor. 18 inches is bigger than my laptop. <laughs> but it's not going to be at that price, which is four hundred bucks. It's not going to be the bestest screen ever. Uh, we've played. I think we actually might have played with this one or its predecessor. But but what is is it for watching TV or what is it for? Uh, watching the uh, NFL games. I'm buying it through Verizon, my carrier. Oh, good. And be because of that, they'll I'll subsidize that. The NFL games. Yeah, that's right. On Sunday and Monday. Yeah. Here this will be and, uh, this will be a great. It won't be as good as a TV. It won't be as good as a TV, but it'll be pretty close. And then you get the benefit of it being a tablet, so you can do all that other stuff too. No, I think this is very good. We we played with its brother uh, a couple uh, earlier uh, this year, and I was I was impressed. What you give up on the this is the Galaxy View. What you give up is the um, screen isn't uh, super great. It's okay. It's good enough to watch uh, TV on for sure. So yes, I recommend it. And here's good news. I don't think anything from Samsung is going to burst into flames ever again. I think they learned their lesson, don't you? All right, time for one more call. Jim in Newport Beach, hang on. You're next. Jim wants uh, to make a comment about cord cutting, exactly, exactly what you're doing. Uh, so stay tuned in just a second. But first, let's talk about backing up your data. Man, you got to do that. I don't care what you're using for your computing platform. Whether it's a gaming rig, a business rig, a tablet, a phone, backup is critical. Backup saves you from the worst. Loss, disaster, fire and flood, human error, vandals through the form of malware and ransomware. If you've got a good backup, you can just, you know, just say, brush it off. Because I got a good backup. I don't need to worry about those things. And if you don't have backup, then you're always at risk because hard drives die. People make mistakes. Bad guys get into your system. And then what will you do, as they, Carl Marlin used to say, what will you do? Jim in Newport Beach. I think it's fitting to talk about cord cutting as our last call. That's when you get rid of the cable company and you get all of your content over the Internet. What do you think, Jim? Is it a good idea? Are you a cord cutter? Uh, good afternoon, Leo. I've been wanting to call in for about 10 years, so I'm a little backed up with questions. <laughs> uh, so. Don't save it up next time, you know? It's spread it I out. Know, I know. <laughs> well, uh, let me go real quick because I had a couple questions for sure. you. Uh, a couple weeks ago, a lady called in about she wanted to do the cord cutting and so on and so forth, but she was concerned about getting local channels. And basically, I mean, you just go to Amazon and, and buy a, a high-def antenna, and you get your local station. If you're close enough to town. Now, I live far enough from San Francisco that I can't get live local. Ah, okay. I can get Channel 50, which isn't enough. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I want 2478. You know, I want the low-number channel. So that's absolutely true. If you The best deal, well, I, period, in yeah, HDTV my... is over the air. Absolutely. You know, my sister has uh, lives in Punta Gorda, Florida, which is about 30 miles south or north of uh, Fort Myers. And she has, you know, she gets all the local channels yeah. in Fort Myers. Yeah, so then you don't have to worry. You don't need a cable. But cable was invented for people like me who are too far away from town to get it. There, yeah, there are a couple of places. Right. Yeah, I recommend tvfool.com because you can enter your zip code and you can see what you can get over the air. And you're absolutely right. A good over-the-air antenna you're going to get un almost uncompressed HD. It's going to look so much better even than the stuff you get on cable and satellite. So I agree with you. Well, yeah, the, uh, you just finished the commercial on Carbonite, and I had purchased Carbonite. I've been using it for years. And I had one, uh, one, one of my questions is that I use a, a master Excel spreadsheet every day and, uh, for my work, and it got corrupted. And I thought, oh, I said, all I have to do is go to uh, Carbonite and download it. And uh, Carbonite had already backed up. It was up too fast. File. So what you want to turn on, and it's available on Windows versions of Carbonite, is something called versioning. 
And what versioning does is it doesn't just back up the latest version. It would have it would have had you had it on had previous versions. So look up That's what a friend of mine said. Yeah, yeah. I, I have an iMac. Uh, it doesn't do it on the Mac. So oh, for right. versioning on the Mac, you know, I would still use Carbonite for like disaster recovery, but do you set up Time Machine? That's exactly what Apple's Time Machine does. It preserves previous versions of files. In fact, that's yeah, why they call it Time Machine because you can. I just start duplicating the file every every. That's another way to do so. it. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Um, it, I should think we'd be past those days, but it still happens that files get corrupted, and if a corrupted file is backed up, well, <laughs> restoring <laughs> yeah. it isn't going to help. That's what I thought. I yeah. Whoa. Okay. They don't. As far the, as I know, they don't do versioning on the Mac. They do it only on Windows. Yeah, this is kind of a, a you know what complaint. Com yeah. Hang on, I have to end okay. this show, but I will keep oh. you on the line. We can talk after the show because I know you have a pent up demand. I want to thank Michael Cozio for doing the music today. Great job, Michael. Kim Schaffer for answering the phones, and most importantly, thank all of you for being here. We couldn't do it without you. And I hope you'll come back next time and join me. And let's talk tech. I'm Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. My, and uh, Jim's still on the line. Hi, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I know you want to, you've been on. It's all right. No, no. Hours, and uh, so. this is going to be part of the podcast, just not part of the radio show. Well, two things. One is just kind of, I know uh, I have my iMac. It's about 10 years old. Oh, it's time and, for a new uh, one. Yeah. Well, not, yeah. It's, it runs like a champ. But uh, the reason I haven't upgraded is because I run uh, Microsoft Office with Entourage. Uh-huh. And I know you're not a fan of Entourage, but I'm in commercial real estate. And even even Microsoft isn't a fan. They killed Entourage a while ago. Oh, I could, you know, <laughs> I'd, love to, I'd love to get my hands around the person who killed it. Yeah, well, they just, you know what, I think Outlook for Mac is basically the same, I think. I don't know. No, not quite. No? But Entourage uh. has, well, it is, and it's, it's you know, it's... So it's Entourage. not just a renaming. They didn't just rename Entourage. They actually broke it. Right. Yeah. Well, see, the the thing about Entourage is that you can set up uh, like it has a great contact management system, right? Where you can create, you know, I open up another uh, window or page, so I have my uh, uh, email on one page, and then I have right. my uh, project management on the other page, and basically, so I have, let's say, I have five commercial real estate loans in process, and each project, you probably already know this, but each project folder has the contact right. of the person. And I'm, every time you, know, you talk to them, every time you email them, a complete record of your, it's of your interactions. Yeah. It's all there. That's a very nice feature. And the other thing you could, yeah, which is, as, since I'm older than 50, you can increase the size of the fonts. <laughs> I of the, like that the too. The size of the folders, yeah. you know. So, so partly what's happened is, is yeah. this yeah. new category called CRM has overtaken contact managers you remember act which was a great yeah i yeah. use act yeah yeah and they killed that for the mac um almost all of this stuff now has been replaced by crm even microsoft now uh pushes you towards microsoft dynamics their crm platform because crm customer relations management is exactly what you're talking about uh salesforce of course is the other big company that does this and there are good CRM uh, programs for the Mac, but it's probably more than you want, right? You just wanted a simple. I know, I know exactly what you're talking about with Entourage. That was the best feature. Was this kind yeah, of I unified? I don't want to get involved in something that's costing me a hundred dollars a month or right. whatever. You know, right. it, it just because uh, I went into, I Googled Act and I came up with some company that runs Act. Well, or, I would look at. Do you you yeah. you have a subscription to Microsoft Office? Yeah, I do. I, okay. I run it on my, uh, my. I would I would look at what it would cost to add Di uh, Dynamics, which is their okay. CRM platform. It's a very good platform, um, and it's, uh, it's probably not. Too, I don't know. It may not be too expensive. You're already paying probably fifteen bucks a month. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't. And know. I really don't use it. That I really don't use it. No, I know. I mean, yeah, this is this is this is my, my uh, iMac. Yeah, yeah, this is this is Microsoft's, you know, annuity. They, uh, they no, yeah, they no longer want you to buy anything outright. They want a monthly fee. So Dynamics 365 is their solution. That's part of the Office 365 suite. 
It's. Pr I'll be honest with you. I I see, I hear what you use it for. It's probably more than you want. Yeah, I'm, in other words, I can keep my iMac and running and keep using Entourage um, until the Mac dies. Yeah. <laughs> so, what is, does I'm anybody who's anybody sense. listening? Uh, I mean, in the chat room, have yeah. a have a. You understand what he likes about Entourage is he has a. It's a essentially it's a contact manager that keeps track of all your contacts with a customer, keeps the whole kit and caboodle, the the interactions by email and phone. The documents associated with it, uh, you know, all the attachments and everything, everything you know, so, all yeah. together in one spot. So Joe calls and says, you know, hey, Jim, well, how's my loan going? And you go, oh, Joe, I got it right here. And you have that folder, you know, that page with everything, right. everything you've told yeah. Joe, everything you promised Joe, your time frame, all of that stuff. Is there anything like that on the Mac that isn't, you know, that complicated? Yeah, Dynamics, they're saying, is about 50 bucks per user per month. So it's... Maybe too expensive. That's a little more than yeah, that. yeah. I mean, I can I can go to it when and if. Well, it's also it also there's a cost yeah. beyond the dollar cost, which is the complexity cost. You know, it, you've got something that works. It it works with your workflow. It works easily. It, it's so simple. It's yeah. unbelievable. See, I almost feel and like the there is, should be a note taking look, program like that, like right. Evernote or something. You know, that is that it has sales focus that would be like that. And I, I'm sure there is something like that. I just don't. I just well, I don't think know. it took Microsoft a lot of work and time and engineering to develop that entourage, and why they let it go with that, you know. <laughs> why does Microsoft or any of these companies, for that matter, do anything? I don't. I, you know, I, unfortunately, companies. And it drives me insane that Steve Ballmer has a twenty-two billion dollar <laughs> net worth. <laughs> it's just. I know. <laughs> Well, part of, partly because they stopped focusing on what customers want and started focusing on what works for the business. And unfortunately, yeah. that, that leaves a, a, a toll. Of, oh, here we go. Zoho. I, you know what? Zoho might be good. Zoho yeah, might be I a good solution. I, I, I looked at that, and it doesn't... Um, you can't create groups and stuff, but that's the, they, I think they took ACT over. Yeah. Zoho is uh, web-based, which is nice, so you can use it on a variety of computers. That would be nicer. Yeah. Um, Mary Jo Foley wrote a piece. We'll put it in the show notes. Thank you, Hell's Kitchen, on ZDNet. Microsoft adds Outlook customer management to Office 365, the uh, small business plan. That's probably the closest analog to what you're doing right now. And if you probably have the Office 365 SMB subscription. So see if uh, they've added this customer manager. That may be what you want. And Soho has a free CRM module Module you could at least look at, Zoho.com slash CRM. Yeah, this, I've been trying to get through to them, ask about, because I, I asked about creating a group, a project folder, right. and they said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> so I, okay. I said, what's the point of this then? Hey, one, one last thing. Sure, uh, Jim. In, in the uh, cord-cutting cable deal, I have a friend of mine is a, is a geek, and I have a girlfriend who likes to watch, you know, Real Housewives in yeah. real time. And uh, then I like to watch CNBC. And it's kind of like, he said, well, if you want to watch Real Housewives, you have to get Roco. And he said, if you want to watch CNBC, you have to get Apple TV. <laughs> and then if you want to do this, you subscribe to Swing TV. It's crazy, you know? isn't it? Well, um, I was thinking maybe that'd be something that somebody could figure out and do an Excel spreadsheet as to which, what, you, what you need to do that. I would look at um, PlayStation View, V-U-E, which is Sony's cord cutting, cutting solution. What What is Real Housewives on? It's on uh, Bravo, right? Yeah. Let me see if they have Bravo. Um, they, I'm pretty sure they have CNBC on it. They. This is the best broadest range of stuff they they just got showtime for a buck a month which is pretty awesome wow. yeah but i mean it's like the whole thing is like 36 or something let me see uh if they've got they got abc they got fox it, they do have locals in some uh, areas too by the way which is pretty cool yeah they yeah. do have bravo uh, but well, they and they, they a lot of times the the bravo is a year behind like Swing TV, they have. Yeah, no, no. This is this is this is current Bravo. So oh, with okay. with the um, the core, I mean the act, the cheapest solution they have, which is forty bucks a month, you do get Bravo and CNBC. So I would look at this. You can watch this on your. They just added Apple TV, 
You can watch it on your uh, Roku as well. Um, yeah. And, you, of course, if you have a PlayStation. But this is VUE. It's Sony's. Sony's got right now, I think, the best offering for people who want to cut the cord. Uh, and the cheapest plan comes with both Bravo and CNBC. So both of you would be happy, plus a bunch of other stuff as well. So Sony PlayStation, VUE? VUE, yeah. Just if you Google Sony VUE, You'll see, and they have different plans with different net channels, but the cheapest plan has the two channels you want, including also ESPN, which uh, is a is kind of critical. Yeah. And in some areas, you're in uh, Newport Beach. I think L.A., they do have locals on this as well. And, yeah. And then, um, uh, but but the beauty part of this is, is they are making apps for everything. Uh, unlike Amazon, which won't put its app on Apple, and vice, it, this is, you know, it's very frustrating. Uh, but 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 Sony has decided we're going to put this everywhere, including uh, I believe. Uh, do you have an Apple TV yet? You or you have a Roku? Uh, Amazon Prime. Um, yeah. So Amazon Prime. Uh, so you have an Amazon Fire TV or Fire Stick? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, think Amazon I think Fire they has it for Amazon Fire TV. I think they have it. They have app, They're putting it everywhere. They want to put it everywhere. You know? So what do I just go Google? Uh, do I yeah, Google it's at PlayStation.com, but if you just Google PlayStation VUE, you'll see what it is and all the features. Uh, is that something you download or you go buy it's a, Well, you would. it's an app. So the que I would check okay. to see if it's on the Fire. Uh, if it is, then you're golden. Otherwise, it is on the Roku already, uh, and it will be on Apple TV if it isn't already. They announced an Apple TV app. Okay. Uh, and I guess you could use a Chromecast as well. You could run the app on your phone and then use the Chromecast to uh, to watch right. it. So there are many so ways to the, watch it. On my Mac computer, you're saying use Time Machine or something? To Time Machine does versioning. That's really the... I'm not a fan of Time Machine, but that's where it shines. It'll keep previous versions up to the extent of the size of the drive that you're using for backup. So Well, that, that'll work on an old iMac? Ah, well, what's the latest version of uh, Mac OS you, have, you can get? I think 10.6.8 yeah. or something. Yeah, I think it'll work with 10.6. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking at buying a new... Um, I took your... I, buy, I listened to your show yesterday. I am buying my sister an LG TV. I, Good. Oh, she'll love it. The B6? Recommended it. Oh, yeah. she's going to flip her lid. Yeah, I'm going to send it down to her for Christmas. Oh, that is a nice... That's a very nice gift, Jim. That is... Yeah, it's really it's the the price they did drop the price on yeah. it, so it's it's quite it's quite a steal. That's a that's a heck so I appreciate of a, you bringing that up. Heck of a TV. Well, Scott, thanks, Scott Wilkinson. He's the one who mentioned it. Yeah, that's a yeah, heck yeah. of a deal. Hey, one last question. You know, I, uh, I'm going to be buying some new computers. I'm probably going to buy a, a an Apple uh, uh, laptop. But I always feel like when you every time I buy an Apple, it's it's like buying a Ferrari. It's overpriced. Yeah. Here's my recommendation on the Apple. That looks great. Get you know. the new one without the touch bar. You'll save money. I don't think the touch bar is of any value at all. Yeah. And you'll save money. You'll get all the all the benefits otherwise of the new Apple uh, MacBook Pros without that, ex that extra expense. Yeah, they, they're just a wonderful machine. They're overpriced, but what the Well, heck? and what we're learning about these new... And actually, I'm very, extremely disappointed. Uh, these new Apple MacBook Pros are completely unrepairable. Everything is soldered in. They're neither upgradable nor repairable. And oh, they're God. not recyclable because they've they've glued in the batteries so... In, you know, so hard that no recycler is going to be able to do anything with these. They're going straight in the landfill. Yeah. But... Keep yeah, it for I 10 years, you won't feel guilty. Yeah, I have an old MacBook uh, that I bought along with my iMac, and I spilled a martini on the keyboard. <laughs> so I still... Jim, you, you're, you're, you're living the high life. <laughs> yeah, I keep thinking about fixing it. That's, no, it's just too much time and bother. To fix it. I, I, I think if you, it depends on how dry that martini is. A really dry yeah, martini okay. should be no problem. That's good. Listen, Leo, thank you so much. Anytime, Jim. Time, and I enjoy your show. Thanks and for listening. And happy, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcast. 
for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.